Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a symposium put on by the Canada-US Law Institute on harmful algal blooms in the Great Lakes Basin, a binational subfederal approach. So this is going to be a interesting symposium where we will have two professors give us a proposal on how to solve harmful algal blooms. That will be followed by a panel of government regulators who will comment on the proposal and give their insights and thoughts. Then we will have an academic NGO panel that will do the same. And then our two presenters, uh, Catherine Friedman and Irina Creed, will give us their conclusion. I'm Steve Petrus. I'm the U.S. National Director of the Canada-U.S. Law Institute, and it's our honor and privilege to put on this program. A couple of uh, words at the start. This is a symposium, and the point of this symposium is to share ideas and to enter into an open and honest dialogue with people being allowed to present their ideas and thoughts freely and openly. This is not a symposium where we're here to pin anybody down or to try to get the uh, official position of any state or regulatory body. Rather, we're here for a dialogue and exchange and the opinions and thoughts and ideas of the presenters, although they may be part of states, governments, institutions, will be their own. Uh, and we're looking forward to your participation and an open dialogue. There is also CLE credits for this program. And at the end of the program, we will give the activity number for those CLE credits. So uh, we do have a very tight schedule because we have an outstanding presentation followed by seven members of the regulator panel and three members of the academic NGO panel. I'm going to moderate the questions uh, for all the panels, but before we start, it's our honor and privilege to have with us the former governor of the state of Michigan and also former U.S. ambassador to Canada, as well as a member of the executive committee, actually the co-chair of the Canada-U.S. Law Institute. So, Governor Blanchard, we look forward to you now introducing our topic. Okay, can we, can we go to Governor Blanchard, please? Mark and Eric. Um, now I know, I know, I just spoke with Jim, so I know he's on as a participant, so. Let's see. Let's see if we can get him here. Eric? We're looking, Steve. Okay. And I hope uh, I hope he's got his video on. We'll okay. see. Okay. He's been added to as a panelist. Oh, okay. Great. These are the challenges in today's Zoom world. Just bear with us for a minute. How are we doing, Martin? Do we have Jim? Uh, he's been added as a panelist. He just needs to turn on his camera and uh, unmute himself and, and start his, uh, start talking. Oh, okay. All right, Jim, I hope you heard that. Uh, uh, there you, you go. Yeah, there you are. Now we see you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have a device. To, I mean, I'm looking, and I, I look. I do two or three Zoom a day. I don't. There's nothing here for me to put the camera on. But if you can hear me, that's yeah. probably enough. So let me and, just. And, and we can see you too. We do see right. you. Good. Good. All right. Well, then. Uh, all right. Anyway, thank you, uh, and thank you, Steve, uh, and welcome everyone. This is going to be a really interesting, important symposium. Uh, with algae blooms in the Great Lakes Basin, uh, a binational or a sub-federal approach. You know, it's interesting. 
having served as a member of Congress from Michigan, then governor, ambassador to Canada, I've actually worked on cross-border issues for a number of years, starting with acid rain in the 70s and 80s, and certainly as governor dealing with Great Lakes issues. Uh, you know, a binational approach has been um, a hallmark of our relationship with Canada, really, I think probably <clears throat> at least formally starting in 1909 with the Boundary Waters Treaty, which uh, ended up uh, creating the International Joint Commission, I might add, headquartered in Windsor and in Washington, D.C. Uh, but over the years, I've worked on a lot of different issues with the Canadian provinces, particularly Ontario, but also Quebec, uh, on Great Lakes issues, including the Great Lakes Charter that we signed uh, to uh, uh, prevent the diversion of Great Lakes water from our basin, the Great Lakes Toxics Agreement, where we went forward to clean up and begin to clean up and locate toxic hotspots, a lot of other different approaches that we've had. You know, not to mention, aside from the environmental issue, the free trade agreement, NAFTA, the new NAFTA. So there's an enormous amount of cooperation between our states and provinces and between our federal governments. And this is another area where I think it's really interesting to talk about how we go about dealing with uh, algae in the, uh, in the Great Lakes. It's a serious issue. It affects the economy. It affects tourism. It affects our health. Uh, our enjoyment of the Great Lakes. And of course, Michigan being in the center of the Great Lakes region, we have a particular interest. I, I do want to welcome different panelists from all over uh, the Great Lakes region. And of course, we have a presenter from the University of Saskatchewan. So this is a big deal. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of it, of course, with our Canada U.S. Law Institute. And so on behalf of our executive board of the Institute and everyone who cares about U.S. Canada uh, cooperation. Welcome. Uh, enjoy the program, and I look forward to the presentations. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Governor Blanchard. Appreciate that that great introduction. And now it's my pleasure to to uh, turn the program over to the Ca Canada U uh, the Canada National Director of of the Canada U.S. Law Institute. Uh, my, my counterpart in Canada, uh, Professor Kai Carmody. Kai is with the uh, Faculty of Law of the University of Western Ontario, and he and I work together as the two co-national directors, and he's going to introduce our two presenters. Kai, the floor is yours. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Kai Carmody, and I'm Associate Professor at uh, University of Western Ontario Faculty of Law in London, Ontario, Canada. And since 2002, the Canadian National Director of this Institute. I'm very pleased to be able to join this event today, an event which has been organized with great professionalism by my American counterpart and good friend, uh, Steve Petrus, uh, as well as some very able technical uh, personnel on the Cleveland side of our arrangements, uh, Eric Siller and Martin Raska. I'd also like to bring uh, greetings on behalf of our Dean, Professor Erica Chamberlain, and to wish all of you well in this very challenging time. I think it's a testament to the vision of Steve and other organizers of the symposium that an event like this can continue to go ahead at times like these. I've been asked to say a few words of introduction uh, about our symposium co-conveners, um, Dr. Irena Creed and uh, Dr. Catherine Friedman. Irena Creed is a professor of the School of Environmental and Sustainability uh, and Associate Vice President Research at University of Saskatchewan. Irena earned her Bachelor of Science, Master's and PhD degrees at the University of Toronto. And prior to um, taking her position at University of Saskatchewan in September 2017, she was a professor and Canadian Research Chair <clears throat> here at Western. Her work has been recognized with many awards and honors, including receiving an honorary doctorate from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala, Sweden, and being inducted as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada uh, only in last year in 2019. Catherine Brick Friedman is a research associate professor of law and planning at the University of Buffalo and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, Canada Institute in Washington, DC. She's a multidisciplinary scholar and legal practitioner with a focus on Canada-US law and policy issues. 
Uh, she is a recognized expert in the field, and we've had her on a number of occasions addressing our institute. Her research and teaching focus on binational regional economies, water and policy, NAFTA, labor mobility, and border security issues. Now, <clears throat> many of you may be wondering why and how these two women developed an interest in harmful algal blooms. And by way of comparison, some of you may be aware that uh, about uh, 10 days ago on October 17th, Professor Jennifer Doudna of UC Berkeley and Emmanuel Charpentier of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Pathogens in Berlin, Germany, were announced as the first female pair to win the Nobel Prize for Chemistry this year after their early work in originating CRISPR gene editing technology. It's interesting to note that the seed of their ideas came about one afternoon while they were both attending a conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 2011. And the two women decided to get together and play hooky from a conference, uh, probably not unlike this one. And they decided to walk around the old town of San Juan where they generated the seed for their groundbreaking idea. In contemplating what to say by way of introduction, I had to wonder whether there was a similar anecdote that could be dredged up about how these two women developed their interest in algal blooms. They will, of course, I think, let us know, but they did let on to me that uh, their idea was hatched over plenty of wet red wine in a Toronto hotel room some time ago and has already led to a tremendous amount of insight and collaboration. So without any further ado, I'd like to cede the floor to our uh, two uh, key speakers, Professors Irena Creed and Catherine Burke Friedman. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Governor Blanchard. Um, I think Minister Peterson is on the webinar. Uh, Steve and Kai, thank you so much for hosting this symposium so that Irina and I could present an idea that we've been working on for quite some time now. Um, as Kai suggested, Irina and I have been collaborating on Great Lakes issues for well over a decade. And we've specifically been focusing on harmful algal blooms probably within the last um, six years or so. Irina, of course, bringing the science perspective to the table and I, bring the law and governance and policy perspective to the table. Uh, we we um, co-published an article last year, what, which really was the impetus behind um, this, our, our recent paper uh, that the panelists have had a chance to look at and the symposium. It struck both of us that, you know, as everybody I'm sure on this call is aware, the, the governance system is not working. It's not working, harmful algal blooms continue um, in the Great Lakes system and um, in some cases are, are um, exacerbated. Uh, they're, they're becoming even more excessive. Uh, so it, it struck us that you know, the, the federal system, as great as it is, is um, you know, maybe, maybe not working. And more importantly, as Governor Blanchard not noticed, or excuse me, noted, um, Maybe something can be done at the state provincial level. As the governor mentioned, there is a long, long history of state provincial engagement between Canada and the United States across a whole host of areas. So we you know, did a little bit of research and realized that no one really explored this idea in detail. So um, we put our heads together and came up with a paper and I will summarize um, uh, Irina and I will summarize our approach in this presentation and then turn it over to the regulators and the um, NGO panel and the academics uh, in the room to provide their perspectives and comment and then we'll open it up. So with that, um, I'll start the presentation. Okay. So I, I just gave you a little bit of history as to how we came to this issue. And really the, the questions that are driving uh, our, our paper and this, this symposium presentation are the following. Is a state provincial framework necessary given the, uh, um, the, com the complexity of the problem and the reemergence of the problem? 
very, very important question from my perspective is, is it possible? Something else that I should note, neither Irina nor I are interested in, um, you know, navel gazing. <laughs> we both are very, very interested in coming up with ideas that have the potential to get, gain some tra traction on the ground. And as you'll see by the end of our presentation, there are some re very real challenges to putting a state provincial framework in place. And we'll get to those at the end. Uh, and the third question is, if a state provincial framework is, is necessary and if it's possible, what would that look like? We have a number of different uh, examples that, that we could turn to as ideas for a framework, but um, that, you know, that is something else that we will touch on later on in the presentation. So, Irina, take it from here. Thanks, Kate, and good morning, everybody. Really pleased to be here. Um, this map is basically showing that uh, harmful algal blooms occur in all five of the Great Lakes. Most of our attention has focused on Lake Erie, but recently we're seeing uh, harmful algal blooms occurring even as far north as Lake Superior. We know that there is a rich diversity of algal species in a harmful algal bloom event, including both native species and invasive ones. And we also know that cyanobacteria are often the dominant in these harmful algal bloom events. I wanted to show this map uh, with the yellow dots being those where that we know there are al algal blooms and the green ones where we know them to be toxic. Remarkably, as I prepared for the paper, I found it very difficult to get data on just where these blooms were occurring. Most of them, uh, especially in the Northern Great Lakes, uh, were derived from newspaper articles. And this really spoke to me about the need for greater coordination between our two countries in terms of being able to monitor where these blooms and where toxic blooms occur. For if we cannot uh, monitor them and map them, it poses a great challenge for managing them. On the next slide. Kate, can you move this slide forward? Yep, yep. hang on. There we go. Thank you, Kate. Most of our understanding of harmful algal blooms uh, has occurred due to Lake Erie and the history, the rich history there of blooms. Lake Erie is a focal point because it's the smallest and shallowest of the Great Lakes and therefore more vulnerable to these harmful algal bloom events. In the 1970s, uh, it was declared in McLean Magazine that Lake Erie had died due to these rich algal blooms. And subsequently, a great deal of effort has focused on uh, dealing or reducing the risk of these algal blooms by focusing on phosphorus. Phosphorus has been largely, uh, phosphorus control has led to reduction of these algal bloom events. And shortly after, it was considered one of the greatest success stories of bringing back to life Lake Erie. However, things have changed. And in the 1990s, these harmful algal bloom events have reemerged in Lake Erie. And now they're expanding to and intensifying in the other Great Lakes. Next slide, Kate. Why is this happening? Uh, I decided in the paper to focus on what, where most of our management efforts uh, have been, and that's on phosphorus. And what we know is that there are new sources of phosphorus that were previously unaccounted for or not considered significant. The first one is really uh, though that phosphorus coming from the land uh, surrounding catchments into the lakes. And what we know, now know is that there is a significant increase in the proportion of phosphorus load that is in a dissolved and more reactive form as opposed to the particulate form in the uh, total phosphorus loads. Why is this happening? There's a number of ideas and one of them is related to climate change where you have an increased intensity of storm events that you may actually uh, get more dissolved phosphorus forms uh, that occur on the land and then get drained into the surface waters. Other ideas are actually an unintended consequence of what our previous management systems have been. Zero to low tillage systems on agricultural fields may have had the unintended consequence of allowing more dissolved forms of phosphorus to occur and that is something that we are presently uh, doing research on. But it's not just the land to water connection that we should be mindful of. 
There's increasing evidence that there's uh, atmospheric phosphorus deposition occurring. Much of the work from the US in particular uh, has shown that this is a significant source of uh, phosphorus to water bodies. We're still learning what it could be for the Great Lakes. Also, there are the legacy effects of historical loads of phosphorus to the lake sediments that then uh, become released from the sediments back into the water uh, column. And then finally, the invasive zebra and quagga uh, mussels, which have basically resulted in a reorganization of the phosphorus within the lake, where it draws the phosphorus from the open waters and from the uh, near shore areas, and where cyanobacteria can recycle it quickly and therefore bloom. What's What's of importance in terms of the science behind harmful algal blooms is that we don't really know the relative magnitudes of these pathways or the relative importance of them. And yet when we look at managing and reducing by 40% the loads to the Great Lakes, uh, there are other sources that we need to be mindful of. Further, we also need to understand the relative importance of other cofactors in creating a bloom. Uh, and in particular here, I'm thinking about nitrogen and uh, urea, a form of nitrogen, where cyanobacteria are known to outcompete other um, algae when urea is present, as well as trace metals. Kate, if you can move the slide forward. We know the science and we, is, is progressing always. We know that there are new sources, but we are also learning that there might be new exposure pathways uh, that place people at risk. For a long time, we've known the consequence to drinking water, and we just have to think about uh, recent newspaper coverage about the uh, millions of dollars that were spent uh, in terms of treating water. In fact, it's ironic to be next to the one of the greatest uh, freshwater resources in the world, and yet people having to buy bottled water uh, just to avoid toxins in the water. More recent evidence is now starting to show that the wave action of what large water bodies create aerosols and that people can inhale uh, toxins through these aerosols. And finally, we now we are uh, emerging evidence showing that these toxins can also pass through food webs. And so the fishery industry and everything uh, such like that would also be at risk. The science still needs to progress further, and especially in Canada, we often focus on just microcystin. I believe that's the same in the US as uh, when we think about risk of exposure, especially for people. But we know that there are different forms of microcystin and each of those have different forms of toxicity. But we're now starting to learn that when you have microcystin, you can also have a cluster of other toxins associated with it that we have not started to really monitor uh, and um, in a very comprehensive way, especially from a regulatory lens. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Kate. Thank you, Irina. Okay. So that was a great summary of uh, the science related to harmful algal blooms. Now we want to turn to some of the binational legal instruments that are in place to address harmful algal blooms. Clearly, there are a number of federal, state, provincial, local uh, frameworks, regulations in each country separately to deal with HABs, including hundreds of best management practices. But for purposes of our paper in this presentation, this symposium, we really are focusing strictly on the binational legal instruments that are in place to help address this problem. As Governor Blanchard mentioned, um, the very first legal instrument that was established um, is the Boundary Waters Treaty that was established back in 1909, uh, a seminal treaty between the United States and Canada and um, created the International Joint Commission which um, I have to say, although it is um, sometimes critiqued in Canada-US circles, it truly is held up as a model for um, the rest of the world as, how, as to how two countries could really um, come together, form an institution, and, um, and move forward on transboundary water issues. Um, well, uh, just a, a couple of things to note with regard to the Boundary Waters Treaty, uh, a foundational principle enshrined in Article 4, one country's pollution shall not harm another, 
another country's water body. It's a critical um, principle that we'll get back to later in thinking about what a sub-federal binational uh, agreement would look like. Um, the IJC right now, uh, for the most part, plays a really important role in terms of gathering data, issuing reports, and recommendations. Um, they do a great job convening stakeholders across the basin. Um, there, and, and again, another point that we'll get to later, and I, I know um, Howard Lerner, uh, who's on um, the academic and NGO panel later, will point to, uh, there's very um, little enforcement. Um, uh, with regard to the IJC and quite frankly, with regard to many of the instruments that we are going to talk about. We then turn to the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. A, again, another seminal agreement in the history of Canada and the United States was that agreement um, that is credited with, as Irina mentioned, uh, eliminating uh, point source pollution, uh, sources of phosphorus, um, uh, at, at, you know, quote unquote, um, points, uh, uh, wastewater treatment, industrial sources, et cetera, et cetera. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement has been amended a number of times, and it's really um, changed the shape of uh, uh, the agreement, the nature of um, the role of Canada, U.S. Uh, cooperation at the federal scale. Very briefly, uh, in um, 1978, uh, ecosystem management was introduced as a concept uh, in the Great Lakes um, uh, water quality world. Um, in 1983, uh, there were further commitments by Canada and the United States to reduce phosphorus. 1987 saw the introduction of community participation, lamps and wraps, and um, importantly, the creation of a binational executive committee is a mechanism for coordination and collaboration between Canada and the United States. Um, uh, Environment Canada and the US EPA were able to consult directly through this mechanism. And that really um, was critical, as uh, many uh, governance scholars have pointed out, that was really critical in terms of reorienting um, work on the Great Lakes uh, away from the International Joint Commission to the federal governments in each country and um, has been noted as a significant governance game changer in the history of uh, binational collaboration. Uh, and then last but not least, we have the 2012 um, Great Lakes Protocol, which adopted principles such as um, adaptive management, continued an ecosystem approach, uh, actually has an entire annex, Annex 4, related to HABs and harmful algal blooms um, with a target of 40% uh, reduction uh, in phosphorus, um, in phosphorus loading and phosphorus. And the protocol established uh, another mechanism, another governance mechanism, the GLEC, the Great Lakes Executive Committee. So the Binational Executive Committee morphed into the Great Lakes Executive Committee, um, where arguably there's more coordination of programs between the federal governments. Um, and there certainly is more um, uh, stakeholder engagement. So moving to the sub-federal level, uh, we have a, um, uh, an example of a, a compact and declaration, the 1955 Great Lakes Compact and Declaration, which um, established the Great Lakes Commission, which plays an important role at the sub-federal state provincial scale in terms of water quality issues. Uh, the Great Lakes Commission fosters dialogue, it gathers data, it shares information, um, very much like the IJC and, and very much like the IJC has um, little enforcement um, power, uh, can make recommendations and, and convene folks, but very little enforcement uh, power. We also have um, the 2015 collaborative agreement among Ontario, Ohio, and Michigan. And um, this agreement was launched at a meeting of the a Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, Governors and Premiers, 
um, which is another entity at the sub-federal level in the, in the Great Lakes region. Um, these two states in the province of Ontario made a bilateral commitment to reducing harmful algal blooms in um, the Western Basin of Lake Erie and, uh, and agreed to um, reduce uh, phosphorus by um, 40%. And so it was significant because if you read the terms of that agreement, the parties noted that it was an issue, particularly in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, that they could not solve individually, right? So they needed um, to you know, uh, put their collective heads together and think more broadly about how they, at the state provincial level, could get their arms around this problem. So as I... Um, alluded to uh, earlier, there, there, are, there are several uh, problems, governance challenges related to these agreements. And um, they primarily come down to a lack of enforcement. And in some cases, some people would argue a lack of accountability. I, I had the um, privilege of working with some folks in the state of Wisconsin in, um, in Green Bay. Um, uh, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, um, Todd Brennan is on the um, academic NGO panel doing great, great work uh, in um, Green Bay and the Lower Fox River, Lower Fox River um, Basin, uh, uh, attempting to get their arms around this problem. Uh, and, and, this is, and it was in that context where this issue of accountability really came up. It's really hard when you have all of these um, mechanisms, all of these agreements, um, all of these actors, where one person or one entity's accountability ends and where another one begins. And in some cases, uh, actors are hesitant to step up to the plate and assume accountability for a whole host of reasons. So um, the Boundary Waters Treaty, as I uh, mentioned, is limited as um, it's, um, it, it issues recommendations. It has very little um, enforcement power, it has a lot of heft, I think has a lot of moral authority, but very little enforcement. Uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, again, several iterations, and there was great, great traction with regard to point source pollution in the 1970s and um, early 1980s, but um, as the subsequent iterations have demonstrated, and including the 2012 protocol, it, it may not be enough. Uh, the, the challenge is still there. And um, again, by some accounts, is, is getting worse. So it makes me wonder, right? It makes us wonder. Um, maybe, maybe the Great Lakes water quality framework uh, isn't enough. Um, the, the compact and uh, associate um, declaration with um, the Canadian provinces, uh, again, is not binding. And, and again, the 2015 collaborative agreement among Michigan, Ohio, and Ontario is um, very aspirational. Uh, it has the 40% um, uh, uh, reduction as, as um, a target. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you read it, the, the parties um, really don't hold, the, you know, anyone's feet to the fire. You know, which which you know seems to be you know um, a recurring theme. It was a theme that I think that we all know. So uh, this is where we get to um, what Irina and I have been thinking about over the last couple of years. Is a bi-national sub-federal approach part of the solution? That's where we're really interested in hearing your feedback um, and and your insights. On the one hand, it seems as if um, it really might be a path forward, right? There seems to be a um, lack of political will at the federal scale. Um, under the current uh, presidential administration in the United States, the EPA has been cut. Uh, some, you know, might use stronger language, slashed, burned. Um, but there really is not much of an emphasis on um, environmental issues broadly or um, harmful algal bloom specifically as a priority at the federal level. Um, I, I would also venture to say, um, even if a new administration is elected, 
and we have um, the Trudeau government in Canada. I suspect, I don't know, and I would be open to other folks' um, opinions on this, I suspect that this particular topic may not bubble to the top in terms of priorities, quite simply, um, because both countries are focused on managing COVID-19 right now. And I suspect both countries will focus on um, uh, restarting the economy's economic growth as, as, you know, as soon as the pandemic is brought under control and um, life as we know it gets, quote unquote, back to normal. So I'm a little skeptical that the federal governments would step in and um, elevate this um, issue uh, as, as a priority. But again, I'm, I'm open to others' um, interpretations. Secondly, uh, you know, a binational um, sub-federal approach might be a path forward because as Governor Blanchard mentioned, state-provincial collaboration is one of the distinguishing features of the Canada-US relationship. States and provinces collaborate and problem solve all the time, every day. And you can see that in a number of different contexts, um, including the Great Lakes Compact, right? On um, uh, water levels in the Great Lakes. There, uh, it is um, a very, very strong example of state provincial collaboration on a, um, on a water issue, not water quality issue, but on, on an issue in the Great Lakes. So what would, a, what would a framework look like very, very briefly? You know, uh, we seem to have a couple of options. We could do a compact and an agreement um, like the Great Lakes Compact, like the, um, the, the compact concerning water um, levels or the 1955 compact. Uh, we also could do an agreement like Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio entered into in 2015. There are strengths and weaknesses associated with both. There are trade-offs. Obviously, a compact um, which has to be entered into by each state and then approved of at the federal government level by Congress um, is a little bit of a long haul in terms of a process. Uh, and then you have to bring the Canadians in through an agreement because a compact is a um, U.S. Uh, state mechanism for allowing states to collaborate. Um, can't enter into a compact at the sub-federal level with Canadian provinces, but we do have agreements. So you bring the Canadians in through there, and that's how you get um, entire basin-wide participation. As I mentioned, huge lift. Um, and, um, you, you know, but arguably has more legal heft, certainly has more authority, right? So uh, that's an option again, or, or an agreement like um, the two states and the province entered into uh, maybe a little less legal or governance heft, but um, certainly quicker to negotiate and, um, you know, really, can serve an important purpose in terms of information sharing, uh, which you know is you know if you had a spectrum, probably you know at the at the lower end of collaboration in terms of these these issues. But um, it's not easy getting there, and I'm a big proponent of like starting somewhere. So information sharing may be a great way to start. Um, we would also need a steering mechanism, right? Uh, so you know that could take. Um, and I'm not in favor of creating another organization or creating another institution. As many of you in the Great Lakes know, um, there are, I think, I don't know, somebody counted at 1.53 various NGOs and actors engaged in Great Lakes issues. I'm, I'm certainly, and I, you know, Irina and I certainly aren't advocating about creating a new mechanism, but, you know, we have the Great Lakes Commission. We have the um, Great Lakes um, governors and premiers. We have two bodies that play a role in this world, in this space. And, um, you know, it's possible that one of them could take on the role of a steering mechanism. Uh, in terms of principles, um, you know, uh, Noah Hall, who is a prolific uh, professor, uh, scholar in this area, um, couldn't join us today. 
Uh, but he's been working on, actually he couldn't join us because he's um, working on a case before the US Supreme Court, Mississippi v. Tennessee. But in the context of that case, a very important principle has bubbled to the top that I think might be relevant for um, a state provincial uh, approach. And that is the doctrine of interstate nuisance. And if you will indulge me for one second, it is a doctrine um, that, um, let's see, you, uh, in, in terms of um, natural resources that cross state boundaries, you have to balance competing interests in using and preserving these resources, right? So that's the doctrine of interstate nuisance, which sounds very similar and is, you know, quite analogous to the principle um, in Article Four of the Boundary Waters Treaty um, about do no harm, right? So, so we, you know, we have we have a principle that that we could use to guide. We also, uh, you know, would need objectives reflecting science. Um, very, very important. And um, Irina, uh, you know, you know, um, presented some of the really um, great science that is happening in this area. The objectives would have to be reflective of that. And at minimum, all um, of the actors, the eight states and two provinces, would have to recommit to a 40% reduction in, in um, phosphorus loading. And then very, very importantly, as we're learning um, that engagement of stakeholders is really critical and really important. And so we would have to have um, engagement by stakeholders across the spectrum, different sectors, uh, including indigenous people and uh, Native Americans, um, a lesson from um, the uh, uh, Water Levels Compact, uh, those, those particular groups um, were not brought in until later. And it um, was really, so some folks, some scholars consider it a real mistake because if they would have been brought in earlier to the process, different ideas could have been brought to the table that would um, have been reflected in the agreement. So um, that's what a framework would look like. And uh, as I've, just in terms of challenges, I've already, and I'm not even sure if humongous is a real word. And I'm not even sure if that's how you spell it, <laughs> but um, it's a humongous lift, right? We recognize that. It would be a humongous lift. There are problems with enforcement, problems with accountability. Um, oh. Uh, am I, oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Problems with um, enforcement, accountability. And so now I leave it up to the other two panels to help us figure out what do we do? I mean, it's our intention, it's Irina's intention and my intention, whether or not we agree at the end of the day that a bi-national sub-federal framework is the right mechanism for moving forward, this symposium, and again, many thanks to the Canada US Law Institute, has opened the conversation to this happening at the um, state provincial scale. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Catherine, and thank you very much, Irina, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. And now we're going to move into our first panel. A couple of words, though. Now's the time to start thinking of your questions. And if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A of this Zoom meeting, not the chat, but into the Q&A. They are being monitored by Claire Soria, one of our students, and we will collate those and present them as appropriate to the correct individual, we hope. We hope we get that right. Also, I want to point out to everyone that this symposium is being recorded. So if you do have a question or if you do make a statement, please do identify yourself. It's our intention to publish the proceedings of this symposium in the Canada United States Law Journal, as well as the paper that's being presented here today by doctors Friedman and Cree. You should also note that that draft paper has been presented to all our panelists and they're going to comment on it now. Uh, also, you should note that the final section of that paper has not been written because they're going to take into consideration these proceedings when they finally draft that and complete the paper. So first, we're going to move into the regulator panel. We have seven panelists. 
We're allowing an hour and 15 minutes for this panel. We've asked each panelist to give a brief summary of their thoughts and insights in response to this presentation and three to five minutes. Some will have PowerPoint slides, some won't. I do wanna introduce the whole panel first and then we'll go through each presenter. We have Michael Alexander, who's manager, water, surface water assessment section, water resources division, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy for the state of Michigan. We also have uh, next from Minnesota is Katrina Kessler. She's assistant commissioner for water and agriculture policy, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for the state of Minnesota. From New York, we have two panelists, Karen Stainbrook, Chief of Lake Monitoring and Assessment Section, and Donald Zelazny, Great Lakes Program Coordinator, both with the Department of Environmental Conservation for the state of New York. From Wisconsin, we have Dr. Madeline McGee, Great Lakes and Mississippi River Monitoring Coordinator, Beach Program Manager, Office of Great Waters, Great Lakes and Mississippi River, Department of Natural Resources, State of Wisconsin. We also, uh, from Halton, Ontario, a regional authority, we have Chitra Gowda. She is environmental engineer, senior water, senior manager, watershed planning and source protection, conservation Halton. Uh, from the International Joint, um, sorry, from the International Joint Commission, we have Dr. Lucinda Johnson. She's a member of the IJC Science Advisory Board. Associate Director and Water, Initi Water Initiative Director. And finally, from Environment and Climate Change Canada, we have Ms. Tricia Mitchell. She's the Acting Associate Regional Director General, Ontario Region, for Environment and Climate Change Canada's Strategic Policy Branch. We will now start the presentation from our panelists. Our first to present is from Minnesota, uh, Katrina Kessler. Katrina? Thank you, Stephen and others. I just want to make sure you can see my, my slides. Can you hear me and see, see my yes, screen? We can see okay. your slides. They're, they're not in the presentation okay. mode, but we can see them. Okay. You, they aren't in the presentation mode. No, they're, they're in the, you know, PowerPoint. Okay. Well, let's, let's try again. There you go. There you um, go. All right. Now you can see them? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you to the uh, Law Institute. Just, just went back to the... Okay, uh, all right, we'll do it like this. We'll all do right. it like this. Okay, thank you to the Law Institute and to Dr. Friedman and Dr. Creed. And I'm just going to get right into it. I'm going to speak from the perspective of the uh, state environmental protection branch within Minnesota. It's called the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And um, speak to some of the challenges and the opportunities that I see on this topic. And um, Minnesota, which is shown here, you all know what it looks like, is the, the headwaters of three internationally important basins. So we have a, a unique position in working with neighbors, international neighbors and interstate neighbors to um, manage really important resources. To the north, the Red River, to the east, the Great Lakes system, and to the south, the Mississippi River. And um, across the state, like other states and provinces that you're going to hear from, we have a, a really varied land use, geology, geography, and, and landscape use. So we have um, old growth forests, we have some prairies left, and we also have a lot of the landscape that is dominated by agriculture. And while we're not seeing the extent of HABs in Lake Superior that you are in some of the other lakes, as noted, they are, they are showing up. And... Um, happened twice in the last 10 years. And as, as I think uh, Irina or um, Catherine noted, it showed up in the New York Times. In 2018, the New York Times did a story about algae along the Lake Superior shore. And in these, both of these instances where they were made, the, it made the national news, it was the result of what I would say were 500 year plus storm events. So to the point of the changing climate and the increasing challenge in front of us to think about how to manage water resources in the face of uh, impact beyond what we've seen in the past. 
I think we need to really draw on um, data that looks at uh, not only what we know today, but what we might know will be in front of us in the future. And um, that's where I wanted to just start with what I see is that one of the biggest challenges. In my role, we look at uh, data from wastewater and surface waters and creeks and lakes across the state. And um, this really highlights the fact that even within the states and within um, local jurisdictions, there's divisions among who's collecting the data, who's regulating the data, who's talking to the partners. And um, I think we're all often very busy implementing the Clean Water Act or the Safe Drinking Water Act or making sure that if we manage local beaches or um, local recreational opportunities that we're giving the public the information that they need at that moment. And often it doesn't even allow us to take a breath and say, oh, what should my friends to the north know about this? Or I wonder what my friends to the east understand this to be. And in my role, I'm not only working with our um, state and local partners, but also as part of the Great Lakes Commission. And I think this is both a challenge and an opportunity because we have these these international or um, national bodies that exist to kind of bring us together, but we don't necessarily have the time and resources that are needed, and they don't necessarily have the hammer that, that is needed in these situations to drive the work forward. Nor am I saying that we should, we should create more authorities. I'm just saying that the authorities we have are often not working at the pace and um, the synergy that they should. And so this brings me to the second challenge, which really is um, data, because I think that this is how we will fundamentally um, build the political and grassroots will to move forward. And in Minnesota, as shown here, we have a really systematic approach to monitoring. Every two of 10 years, we're intensively looking at the water quality and the biology in these 80 watersheds that are at like the Huck 8 scale. And we are taking all sorts of conventional pollutants and we're taking flow so that we can understand loads. And we have lots and lots of phosphorus data and chlorophyll A data. But when the system was designed, we did not incorporate anatoxin, microcystin. And as a result, we are often behind the curve when these things occur and we're out there and we're trying to work with local governments to take samples, but we don't have the predictive tools that I think would be helpful when we all are faced with how to, how to communicate risks, how to engage people on this. So I think about um, looking at what, 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 what do we have? I know in Minnesota, when we've, we've looked at the eutrophication standards that exist, we know that where harmful algal blooms are occurring, those waters are almost always already impaired for eutrophication for our phosphorus and chlorophyll A standards. So is that something we can build on and then, and then kind of evolve into a more predictive approach? And um, the other thing I'll say is that, and this is highlighted in the paper and, and they did a really good job, Catherine and Irina pointing this out, we, we do well when we have regulated frameworks. <laughs> We have done a great job with wastewater treatment plants. In Minnesota, 99% of the flow is now regulated with really restrictive phosphorus limits. And that's, that's made a huge result in our local resources. And we do not have the fish kills that we had seen 25, 30 years ago. Um, and we have done a tremendous job in low flow conditions, but the challenge in front of us is not low flow. We know that the climate is changing and as a result, our landscape and our our smart human counterparts are changing and they're draining the land faster than they were in the past. So that even when we have decreasing concentrations at wastewater plants or we're changing practices on the land, we're getting rid of the water faster. So the loads overall are not going down. And this is highlighted in the paper too, but I think a lot about this from my vantage, we we're, we're great at regulating to the Clean Water Act, where we have a water quality standard and we have to put TMDLs together and we have to issue permits. But when we have non-point sources and we have to incentivize and build relationships and try to um, get to the economy and the heart and minds of people to change behavior, we do not do very well. And I will just highlight that in Minnesota, as part of all of the great, or as part of all the Mississippi River Basin states, we have a nutrient reduction strategy to get us to our fair share of the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia goals. And um, again, we're we're trying as hard as we can. And I can tell you that 
towards our goal of 2040, we we are supposed to have 55% of the working lands in the state having cover crops, and we're right now at 2%. So for five years, the best we can do is a 2% increase, and we're supposed to be at 55% by 2040. And so we just need to accelerate the pace or change the way that we are coming at this. And the last thing that I wanted to just talk about, because it's not all rainy day. I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities and this is really the nature and the crux of what we're supposed to talk about. I think that things like this and the news that harmful algal blooms are getting, whether that's in Toledo or elsewhere have really raised awareness and maybe not political will at the national level, but I definitely think political will at the local level and at the state level and at the level at which people are making decisions about protection of drinking water, that exists at a different, at a different intensity than it did in the past. And um, the, the next thing I'll highlight here, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of information and we have strategies and we have published papers about it. And we just need to figure out how to connect it and accelerate the, the pace. Um, I want to give two examples of what I think have worked well in Minnesota. Uh, this one of them highlights the IJC work. We we recently, with our partners in North Dakota and Canada, actually worked with the International Red River Board to to recommend the IJC adoption of both nitrogen and phosphorus targets for Lake Winnipeg. And while they're not water quality standards that have the same regulatory oomph as um, as you might for Minnesota standards or Clean Water Act standards, they do set goals. And I think we work well when we have a target. And so I would encourage us to think about what we need to do to move towards setting a goal, holding ourselves accountable, setting interim mind, milestones, and maybe engagement and reporting out to those things. The other success story I'll say, Minnesota, we've started something called the Ag Water Quality Certification Program with our Department of Ag. And this is a voluntary program where farmers enroll through um, USDA dollars as well as state matching funds to get certified that the government will leave them alone for 10 plus years if they adopt practices that are shown and quantified to minimize their nutrient inputs. And we've seen a really, really impressive growth rate there. Again, that, that is one of the places where we're looking for opportunities going forward. And the last thing I'll just say is I think that um, as we think about where we can move with our science, I think predictive tools, maybe it's um, uh, use of uh, LIDAR or um, other GIS tools, I think could help us because even in states like Minnesota where we are investing millions and millions of dollars on monitoring, we are not at the level that we need to be and nor do I think we should be monitoring everywhere all the time. But there are smart people who can help us figure out how to leverage what exists and just take it to the next level so we can be more focused. And so those were my comments, and I will happily turn it over to the next member of the panel. Great, great. Thank, thank you very much, Katrina. Appreciate those comments. Our next presenter on the panel is Karen Stainbrook, Chief of Lake Monitoring and Assessment of the uh, New York Department of conservation and environmental conservation. Katrina. I'm Thank sorry, you. Karen. It's Karen. okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Stephen, and um, good morning, everyone. I don't have slides or fancy pictures. I wish I had taken the time uh, or had the time to do that. Um, so uh, in addition to being the chief of the Lake Monitoring and Ass Assessment Section, I'm also a research scientist at DEC. So we have um, many staff, DEC staff, that work collaboratively with our uh, numerous local, state, federal, and non-governmental partners to understand and implement projects to protect and restore water quality in the Great Lakes. Overall, um, the Division of Water within the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is tasked with protecting and restoring, or, excuse me, protecting and conserving water resources in New York. We have in New York well-established strong programs to address water quality impacts from nutrient over enrichment, including narrative standards, statewide numerical guidance values for phosphorus, and several water body specific numerical values. Beyond the current nutrient criteria development effort that New York has, we have many programs to reduce the impacts through a range of regulatory programs. 
Um, we implement our policies and priorities on a continuous basis through the water management cycle. This consists of five basic steps. Monitoring, assessment, planning and development, implementation and permitting, and compliance and enforcement. These all work together. We call it the water wheel to um, monitor waters, identify issues, and resolve them. Um, New York's Great Lakes Watershed Program is a part of DEC, and they work to protect and restore water quality and ecosystem integrity in New York's portion of the Great Lakes, the lands, and the waters. The Great Lakes Action Agenda guides this program to work with partners to improve environmental quality, conserve and restore natural resources, promote coastal community resilience to climate change, coordinate science and adaptive management, uh, provide research, education, and training, coordinate com community engagement and stewardship, and provide funding and um, provide and identify grant funding. Understanding and combating HABs is a top priority for New York State. We too use science to drive and inform decision making and policy. With the direction and support of Governor Cuomo, New York State has become a leader in overall water quality protection, particularly regarding harmful algal bloom, monitoring, notification, and response. New York State agencies, including um, Department of Health and Egg and Markets, Office of Park Rec Recreation and Historic Preservation have all been tasked with addressing, managing, or studying harmful algal blooms on a statewide scale in New York making it one of the most comprehensive of its kind in the nation. Since 2012, uh, New York has documented HABs in over 400 water bodies throughout the state. This includes everything from very small private ponds to rivers to medium and large lakes to isolated shoreline areas of Lake Ontario. It is likely that the actual extent of HAB occurrence is even greater since most water bodies in New York are not routinely monitored. Based on our experience with HABs in New York, we know that across the board nutrient reductions or a one size fits all approach will not prevent HABs in all water bodies. Several causes and contributing factors of HABs have been documented, but how those causal mechanisms interact, what management strategies could be used to reduce HABs occurrences, and which in water bodies controls will lessen the effects of HABs on a water body uses like swimming, boating, fishing, remain unclear. There are still gaps in the science of HABs, and this is a challenge for all of us. In New York, we have prioritized research focus areas that are needed to advance the study, management, and mitigation of HABs. We believe that multi and interdisciplinary research efforts are needed to integrate knowledge about the mechanism of HABs occurrence, HAB control, or treatment standard strategies, uh, uh, treatment technologies, excuse me, and nutrient reduction strategies, for example, agricultural conservation practices, best management practices, or discharge permit limits. And that research is lacking on how these may be applied on an individual water body and at watershed scales, as well as how best to account for the uncertainty of the pace and extent of climate change. In 2018, Governor Cuomo focused resources and efforts to pre prevent and treat HABs around New York. Since the start of that initiative, more than eight $82 million have been dedicated to HABs-related efforts. These include four regional summer summits that took place in 2018 that brought together experts in the field and local communities. We completed 12 HABs action plans for priority water bodies. We implemented advanced monitoring of HABs and real-time data sharing and testing HABs mitigation technologies on several lakes throughout the state. Building on this initiative, DEC has included HAB sample collection in the ambient water quality monitoring programs, developed a system to compile and interpret near real-time monitoring and surveillance information through the New York Harmful Algal Bloom System, we call it NIHABS, initiated and managed several ongoing HABS research projects, coordinate with state, local, nonprofit, and academic partners, and participate on several state and national interagency HABs work groups to identify gaps in science, mitigation, prevention, communication, monitoring, and how to close these gaps. We recommend that the authors of this paper elaborate on the evolving science of how HABs and how this uncertainty could be addressed in the proposed framework. In addition, we recommend the authors consider how advancements in monitoring and mo modeling may change how we understand contributing sources and how these would be incorporated in the proposed framework. The paper provides a well-researched historical perspective on the programmatic and intergovernmental work 
to control HABs in the Great Lakes. Authors could strengthen their case by including a detailed evaluation of specific regulatory tools available to the different jurisdictions to manage and respond to nutri nutrients, document what work we have completed and what work we're currently active or what we were actively working on. For example, discuss how state completed TMDLs, state funded and facilitated watershed based management plans, which is a bottom up approach, um, how the domestic action plans for Lake Erie, the lake management action plans, or the New York State HABs action plans address HABs. Further, to develop the authors, um, uh, to help the authors evaluate the need for a subfederal uh, binational framework, um, the authors could consider how these state provincial tools add value to the framework and assess how these actions are working. That's all I have, Stephen. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much, Karen. That was outstanding. Our next presenter is Dr. Madeline McGee, Great Lakes and Mississippi River Monitoring Coordinator, uh, Department of Natural Resources for the state of Wisconsin. So, uh, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to um, this symposium, and I hope you guys can see my slides. Um, they're just pictures, so you don't have to look at my face. So if you can't see them, it's okay. Um, we don't I like see to, them right now, so. You don't see them, or you do? No, did, did you, are you sharing your screen? I think you. you I know. am, but let me just try it again. Ah, there we go, yep, okay. Okay, well, I think you'll see the panel. The present. Hey, there you go, okay, good. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I will start off by saying that um, I agree with all the points that Karen and Katrina raised um, in their uh, previous talks. Um, and as a scientist at the DNR, um, I agree that there are significant challenges in reducing nutrients and addressing HABs in the Great Lakes Basin. Professors Friedman and Creed raised many valid points in their writing, but any policy framework needs to address the need for more research and new technology, the role of climate changes, funding, and large-scale systemic farming changes to be successful. Despite new insights from HAB's work on Lake Erie, we still lack important science information and advances in technology necessary to achieve improvements throughout the basin. Existing agreements focus on phosphorus reductions, but we also need to consider the role of nitrogen and reducing its input to the lakes because it plays a role in biomass and toxin production pathways. Next, information gleaned from Lake Erie does not always translate directly to other lakes and watersheds. <clears throat> For example, Lake Superior blooms and drivers are very different from those in Green Bay, Saginaw Bay, and Lake Erie. We need additional research into local conditions and mechanisms so that we can develop place-based strategies that properly balance all ecological objectives in the lake. Other than reducing nutrient loads from land to water, possible prevention measures and mitigation tools that we have in place for smaller lakes are difficult, expensive, and impractical to scale up to the Great Lakes level. Finally, while authors correctly point out that Native Americans and First Nations must be included in agreements, they neglect to consider the importance of incorporating traditional ecological knowledge in science frameworks and policy actions. As we've already discussed, climate changes present a major challenge to the success of reducing nutrient inputs into the lake. Since 2012 in Lake Superior, increasing frequency of significant flooding events results in inputs of sediments, nutrients, and possibly propagules to the lake that can then foster the development of nearshore blooms. This is further exacerbated by Lake Superior's status as one of the fastest warming lakes in the world. These warmer water temperatures, combined with extreme precipitation events, create conditions ripe for HABs in a lake where they previously did not occur on a large scale. Current runoff management BMPs in the whole Great Lakes Basin are not designed to accommodate more frequent extreme precipitation events, and they will not yield expected nutrient reductions, nor even be effective enough to offset anticipated climate impacts. While enforcement measures are an issue in current policies, as we've discussed, Insufficient funding is perhaps a bigger impediment to nutrient reduction goals. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has been invaluable in funding project implementation and increased research. 
However, additional significant increases in sustained funding at the national, state and provincial and local levels for on the ground project implementation and staff resources are necessary. Funding mechanisms in place currently tend to reward those that rely on traditional nutrient reduction strategies instead of promoting new ideas. Taking a lead from the state of Michigan's work on Asian carp, a competitive program where applicants vie for prize money may spur new innovative technologies for addressing harmful algal blooms. Funding hurdles will be particularly challenging considering the impact COVID-19 has had on both sides of the border. However, if we are thoughtful in our resources, we may be able to leverage funds to jumpstart both nutrient reduction and economic stimulus. For much of the Great Lakes Basin, successful nutrient reductions will require significant change in farming and food systems. This is unlikely to be achieved with one framework. Large scale investments and political will are needed to assist farmers in becoming more sustainable and to develop the framework necessary to support small farms and local food systems. Tackling this endeavor while ensuring small farmers can both support their families and increase food security on a local level is a large task. This requires support and implementation assistance to local jurisdictions, NGOs, and extension agencies in each basin to be successful. The greatest challenge is in designing meaningful reductions from land to water that will continue to function effect efficiently in the face of climate change related stressors. The proposal laid out in this symposium is an excellent platform for discussion, and I look forward to the development of a framework that can effectively decrease HABs in the Great Lakes. For this particular policy to be successful, it must work in concert with additional advances in science and technology, recognize and give greater consideration to climate change, explain a substantially increased funding mechanism, and develop a framework for significant systemic changes in farming practices across the basin. All of these must be achieved before HABs reductions can occur. And thank you. Great. Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. McGee, for your presentation. Our next presenter on the government regulator panel is Michael Alexander, Manager, Surface Water Assessment Section, Water Resources Division, Department of the Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, State of Michigan. Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for having me, and uh, I really enjoyed the presentations. I don't have a formal presentation or slide, so unfortunately, you get to stare at my face for a few minutes. Uh, thankfully, the panelists before me um, covered a lot of the same concerns that we have in Michigan. Our resources are vast, as you know, four out of five Great Lakes uh, prefer Michigan. Um, so, you know, we have a lot to, to try and protect. Our programs have been successful as, as other presenters have, dis, have already described in the point source controls. The majority of our um, NPDES facilities are at one um, milligram per liter or significantly less than that. We are, um, part of the Annex 4 process and, and of our, dom our domestic action plan for Western Lake Erie called for a 40% reduction. By 2025 and 2020, our goal was to have a 20% overall reduction. And I, I'm sure no one will be surprised that um, we have come close to that 20% reduction, mainly from point source reductions. Um, the goal going forward, I think, you know, the previous panelists, they, I think they hit it right. You know, we, we need to continue to develop the science and the research, the understanding what's causing, better understand what's causing those uh, harmful algal blooms in Western Lake Erie and, and Saginaw Bay. And, and we are seeing a few in some of our inland lakes that we continue to monitor, but we, we do need to try and expand that science and understand what's triggering those blooms. I, you know, we have a, I think a fairly good understanding about two of the major sources, point source, non-point source. Um, it was interesting to hear about the atmospheric contributions and would love to hear more about that. But our biggest challenge I think right now is dealing with the non-point source. The tools we have in our toolbox is, as Minnesota and, and Wisconsin and, and uh, New York have all said, it's been controlling those non-point source, which of the majority of our controls in place right now are voluntary. Um, they have uh, 
so, so a struggle we have with implementing voluntary actions are getting them implemented in the right place, targeting the highest priorities locations. And so it would be interesting for um, the authors if you could provide some insight as to when you're implementing non-point source regulations, voluntary actions, um, how effective are we or how could we be more effective at implementing them at higher priority areas? Again, that's the research involved in it. Um, we've implemented some plans for trying to do better watershed planning at a small scale, not only in Western Lake Erie, but around the state, but it's time consuming, it's expensive, and you know it's difficult at best. So with, again, with our current tools in our toolbox for controlling nutrient inputs, um, it's voluntary for the non-point source. So looking at better understanding what, um, if the authors could provide some insight about non-point source regulations around the Great Lakes, in the states that have them compared to others, how were they able to do that? What were the mechanisms that they had to develop to get those in place would be helpful for us if, um, if we were to proceed down a, a more regulatory control for non-point source. But at this point, you know, again, we are, we are implementing our tools as best we can. Um, they're voluntary actions. We're trying to take a more targeted approach and we hope to see some success with that. And we're gonna hopefully take what we learn in Western Lake Erie and apply that in other parts of our state. So again, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed the discussion um, and I look forward to hopefully making progress with this going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate those comments. All right, next we're going to move to a uh, regional water re resources regulator, uh, Chitra Gowda. Chitra is with Conservation Halton. She is the Senior Manager for Watershed Planning and Resource Protection. Chitra, the floor is yours. Thanks, Steve. So I'm just gonna share uh, my screen. I do have some slides to share. So bear with me for a moment while I get that set up. Steve, can you please confirm you can see the title slide? Yes, we see it and we see it in the presentation mode. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, um, so thanks again for inviting me to this panel. Lots of great discussions here, a really good uh, discussion paper to look at, uh, you know, by Catherine and, and Irene. And uh, just for context sake, I work at a watershed-based organization, so it is regional. It is watershed based, so the boundaries are, are the watershed for, for Halton. And uh, I work at one of 36 conservation authorities across Ontario. So to put into a bit of context, 95% of Ontario's population lives within a conservation authority. And uh, we're formed under the Conservation Authorities Act in Ontario, and we also have a very strong role on drinking water source protection through Ontario's Clean Water Act, which is a little bit different from uh, the United States uh, Clean Water Act uh, content. So I'm just gonna move along in my slide. Um, so just some overall comments on science and policy, and then I'm going to provide some overall comments uh, with respect to the governance side of the discussion paper. So first off, I do want to commend Catherine and Irene for thinking about this concept. Putting the discussion paper together, it was quite thorough. Uh, with lots of great published science summaries, uh, you know, talking about the current legal framework and proposing a new sub-federal approach to, uh, to managing harmful algal blooms. So again, they need to be commended for, uh, for that entire research and thought process. So just a few comments on that is, uh, again, just in line with what everyone else has been saying is that we know that the science of harmful algal blooms is quite complex, and this is ongoing science. So we haven't finish that research as of yet. And new studies are, are showing some quite surprising things. And so with my third bullet point on this slide, that first uh, sub bullet point refers to a point that was from uh, Catherine and Irina's discussion paper, uh, which was quite surprising again. Certain agricultural best practices might be contributing to the plant available phosphorus in the Great Lakes and therefore supporting the, the algal blooms. And, uh, and another study, a very recent one, August 2020 actually, by the International Joint Commission, they're looking at uh, pairing different stressors and looking at those combined effects or those combined interaction effects. 
So for example, an increase in lake nutrients results in a decrease in PCBs in fish. And so there are some interesting studies that are coming up. Um, we need to keep track of those. And so the, the discussion paper does allude to the fact that um, science and technology alone are, are not enough. We need to have some legal instruments and policies in place and strengthen the subfederal approach. My comment there is, is that the ongoing scientific research itself, it does bear a direct influence on you know, policies and where you apply them and whether to apply them or not. And so I'm definitely not averse to implementing the approach on the policy side of things. But I think my comment to the authors is that where policies are thought about, they need to be agile. They need to move with the changing science. And the one thing we know is that we have a changing science, we have climate change, the policies need to be agile, they will not be able to be stagnant. So I, I encourage the authors to look at, um, you know, tackling that challenge of how to keep the policies up to date and in line with current science. So for example, if there are certain agricultural best practices that are perhaps contributing to the issue, well, what does the science say in terms of um, how we can manage that? How should the policies evolve accordingly? And of course, the last point on this, uh, this slide, which I think everyone can agree to, is that incentive programs are really good. Um, they are not the, the magic bullet, we know that, but uh, they definitely support science-based uh, best practices. Just moving over to some overall comments on the governance. The binational state provincial approach was quite interesting and seems to have a strong case. I would suggest some modifications though in order to, to manage the, the harmful algal blooms is to look at broadening that uh, governance so that you leverage the different levels of, of governance that exist uh, while also recognizing a very strong point in the discussion paper is that perhaps things are not quite working as they should be. But we also need to think about the funding and the action that are happening at various levels. So for example, in Ontario, we do have 36 watershed agencies that are governed under the Conservation Authorities Act. And we have a variety of governance, funding and action taking place there. Our board of directors of each of those conservation authorities are municipal elected officials. So we have that very strong tie to our communities, our municipalities. Also look at how the provincial state, uh, sorry, the state provincial approach can be incorporated into existing frameworks. And I'll get a little bit more into detail on that in the next couple of slides. And of course, maintain ongoing scientific research as the basis for policies to be nimble and agile and to move along with the changing science. And so there's the, there, the current authority and there's also potential for improved governance by federal govern government should also be included, I think, within the discussion paper. Um, and also similarly along those veins, consider the local governance by municipalities and, and within the Ontario context, the watershed uh, organizations. The discussion paper had a lot of information about the US side of things and some information about what's going on in Canada. I would recommend that the authors incorporate the governance efforts um, and the plans um, that are within the Made in Ontario Environment Plan, which was developed by the province of Ontario last year, and also give due consideration to the local governance with conservation authorities because they are on a watershed basis. Lots of programs and services there to help uh, support the reduction in harmful algal blooms. And also Canada, the federal government has proposed a Canada Water Agency recently. And so while that is not finalized, it is definitely an opportunity to look at exactly what Catherine and Irina are talking about, which is perhaps a lack of, of, of um, you know, legal instruments and strength uh, within the federal governments in terms of managing harmful algal blooms. So that is an opportunity for us to, uh, to weigh in on as well. And so on this slide, I just provide a bit of a concept and it's only an idea. So the center of this diagram speaks to the, uh, the focus of the discussion paper, which is a strong state provincial legal agreement, you know, in some way or form, but that alone needs to fit into the broader context. We have our federal governments, we have our municipalities and other communities, including the indigenous 
communities and within Ontario, we've got the watershed agencies and all of these have relationships, uh, you know, amongst themselves. And so, um, you know, there's support, of course, for, for strengthening the state provincial approach, but it cannot stand alone. It would need to also look at the existing agreements and the existing um, pros and cons of everything else. And so rather than a top down or bottoms up approach, you can see with the green arrow mark on the side is that there's governance to be recognized at all levels. And this is my last slide. Um, is to reconsider the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. It is a well-established framework for collaboration. That being said, uh, Catherine and Irina do a good job of opening it up and talking about the pros and cons and, and where perhaps uh, there is more strength needed. It does not provide for long-term funding. It does not impose mandatory policies on the ground. And so my suggestion to the authors would, would be to revisit the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement structure and function to perhaps incorporate their suggested subfederal approach in a phased manner that is again well connected and well informed by ongoing scientific research. So the two need to go in tandem, the, uh, the approach and the scientific research. With that kind of a approach, so looking at the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, we could leverage existing strong relationships, collaborations, while at the same time addressing the author's concern, which is the need for strengthened uh, policy and, and implementation. And uh, that's it. Great, great. Thank you very much, Chitra. That was great. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Ms. Trish, Trisha Mitchell. She's the Acting Associate Regional Director General, Ontario Region for Environment Climate Change Canada's Strategic Policy Branch. Uh, Tricia, floor is yours. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. And are they in the right mode? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, I wanted to start just by saying thank you so much for having me here today. Um, on a personal note, I was part of the team that drafted and negotiated the 2012 protocol to the water quality agreement, and I currently lead the nutrients annex um, under the agreement. So this have, being able to talk about Great Lakes governance and harmful algal blooms in, in one conversation, it's like Christmas morning for me. I'm going to have to work really hard to keep my uh, comments brief because I have a lot of them. <clears throat> so. First, I guess I wanted to start by just um, acknowledging how critical of an issue um, harmful algal blooms and, and toxic and nuisance algae in general is in terms of a threat to the Great Lakes. And that's why even though um, Canada, I think, is a pretty small player in terms of our, our loads, at least in the Lake Erie context where our efforts have been focused to date, uh, we represent about 10% of the loads. And, and really, when we talk about the Western base and the harmful algal blooms, um, the science has shown that's really driven by the mommy. But nevertheless, I mean, we really have committed to doing our part. Um, and, and we've invested a lot in addressing the issue. The paper that we're talking about today um, asked the question about a subnational governance framework and, and would this be a better way to address the issue um, in the Great Lakes? And I think, um, well, it does a very good job of identifying existing governance mechanisms. There's a few important points that are maybe missed or that I'd like to bring forward as part of the conversation. So. As the, as the paper notes, we work together under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, Canada and the US um, cooperatively to address water quality protection. And I think the important point is the way that we do this is we get together under the water quality agreement and set out our shared goals and objectives based on the best available science. And the agreement allows us to coordinate our, our monitoring and our science efforts, which, which we do, especially on this issue. But then we each have sovereignty in deciding how we're gonna to get to those shared objectives. We can use our own domestic laws, processes, regulations, policies, and programs. And this is really important because we don't have the same governance mechanisms on each side of the border. So, so we can take that back domestically and decide how we wanna to get to this, the shared goals we've set out. Um, the paper references challenges associated with uh, changing political landscapes. And I think one thing that um, our work under the Water Quality Agreement has allowed us to do over the last 40 years is build strong relationships. And this allows us to maintain the course in spite of changing political and economic landscapes, um, either between the two countries or sometimes within them. 
This is really critical and I don't think it comes out in the paper. We've been doing this for more than 40 years and there is always gonna be times where one jurisdiction or another has to pull back for political or economic reasons. And I think the states and the provinces are just as susceptible to this as the federal governments. And thinking about COVID, I think we're all gonna be figuring out how we deal with this, um, whether it's at the subnational or the, or the federal level. Um, but having everyone around the table working in support of a set of shared objectives and goals means that um, others can step in or at the very least we can mo maintain momentum if, if one jurisdiction or another has to pull back a bit. Um, the next thing I wanted to highlight, did, did my next slide come up? No, there we go. Uh, in Canada, um, the protection of water quality is a shared jurisdiction between the provincial and the federal levels of government. So for example, federally we're responsible for boundary waters, but the province regulates pollution and sets water quality standards. So we also have gotten together and we've negotiated or every five years we negotiate the Canada Ontario agreement on Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health. And that lays out how Canada and Ontario are going to work together to implement the commitments under that we've set nationally under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So because of this, I think it's really tricky to try and separate one jurisdiction out from the other. Um, I don't think we can do it alone. Um, and and for especially for issues like HABs, where, where the jurisdiction is, is so um, shared. Um, in terms of harmful algal blooms, I would argue that we already have a very solid governance mechanism um, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the Nutrients Annex Subcommittee. We have members from all of the relevant national and subnational governments in the Lake Erie Basin, and we have some from outside of the basin who are experiencing HABs, um, such as Wisconsin. Um, we also have representatives from Indigenous communities, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, so municipalities, our conservation authorities are represented, and we have observers from the IJC and the Great Lakes Commission. And I can tell you this is a very active annex. It's probably our most active annex under the agreement. We have senior level engagement from all agencies. So I would say we're already, and when I, when I listen to the list of, of five elements that Catherine outlined of what we would need in a new mechanism, we're already doing all five of those things with all of these players around a table. So, so we're already there. Um, through the work of the committee, the governments have established phosphorus reduction targets for Lake Erie, as well as domestic action plans to achieve them. So on the Canadian side, we have one plan. It's the Canada-Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan. We've identified more than 100 and 20 detailed actions that are going to move us towards the targets. Um, the development of this plan was co-led by five agencies. Two of them are federal, three of them are provincial, and its implementation is being coordinated by a team co-led by Environment and Climate Change Canada and on our Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks with significant um, input as well from our conservation authorities in the Lake Erie Basin who are driving a lot of this action. So again, just to show you how interconnected jurisdictionally our efforts are on this issue. Um, and we we do for, for Lake Erie, so the, the other kind of Thing I would point out is the paper does identify a number of um, areas experiencing HABs, but really the only ones where we have the science to demonstrate that a binational approach is warranted is the Western Basin of Lake Erie. I think the other ones are more um, localized issues and often being addressed at the local level. Like for example, the Hamilton Harbor is being addressed through our areas of concern program. Um, but where we do have um, a binational agreement to action, there is a subnational agreement in place as, as was pointed out for, for the Western Basin of Lake Erie, where Ontario is committed with the U.S. to timelines by which they'd achieve the targets. So I guess in the end, what I would say is I'd ask the question, what's missing? And, and the paper seems to imply that because HABs continue to incur in the Great Lakes, despite the existing governance mechanisms, that it means our governance framework is a failure. Um, but I would argue that this isn't the case. I think the problem of harmful algal blooms is a wicked problem. The science is extremely complex. It's ever evolving. It's exacerbated by factors that are really difficult to control, such as climate change and invasive species. <clears throat> so I guess my last thoughts are, um, what we really need to turn a corner on HABs are three things. And they've been repeated a, a couple of times in the presentation, so I'm, I'm happy to see that. We need innovative policy solutions, um, sometimes shifts in approach. We're exploring things like precision conservation that was used with success in, in Chesapeake Bay. We need strengthened on the ground actions. And we need stronger accountability in terms of reporting out on progress. 
Um, and I think this is where we need to focus our energy and our resource. And I would argue that none of these requires a subnational agreement. And, and in fact, quite the opposite. I think this is a problem that needs all hands on deck um, and all of us at the table. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia. Outstanding presentation. Our next presenter is from the International Joint Commission, Dr. Lucinda Johnson. She's a member of the IJC's Science Advisory Board and Associate Director and Water Initiative Director. So uh, at the University of Minnesota's Natural Resource Research Institute in Duluth, Minnesota. Lucinda. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, Irina and Catherine for putting together um, this very nice uh, piece of work and to the Law Center uh, for bringing us all together. Um, this is quite an amazing um, panel uh, of experts and, and regulators. Um, I will add a disclaimer here. Um, as a member of the Science Advisory Board, I'm um, much more of an academic than a regulator. Um, so I will just uh, very briefly um, talk about the role of the IJC in the Great Lakes and then um, provide some impressions on um, some of the uh, work that, that we've heard about today. Um, I chose not to put together any slides because I realized that um, as the uh, sixth or seventh speaker on, on the panel, um, that most of the impressions that I had um, would have been um, mentioned already. So I will take this opportunity to um, just highlight some of the comments that um, I have had or some of the impressions I've had and um, highlight some of the comments that have come um, before me. So um, just a, a reminder that the role of, of the IJC um, across the board in terms of boundary waters is to approve projects that affect um, water levels and flows. And then secondly, to investigate transboundary issues and recommend solutions uh, affecting all manner of uses um, of, our, of our boundary waters. In the Great Lakes, um, the IJC is um, primary role is to advise the parties regarding implementation and progress in meeting um, the terms of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. One of the major uh, roles that we have in and actions and activities uh, in the Great Lakes is, is to conduct studies um, that provide us with updated and summary information on um, critical issues affecting the Great Lakes. Most recently, uh, the IJC has produced uh, reports re related to the phosphorus issue starting in 2013, uh, where they uh, reported on, on uh, total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus monitoring programs um, in the Lake Erie Basin. Um, in 2017, they conducted a study on modeling approaches uh, to affect nutrient management through adaptive management. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, they looked at modeling approaches. Uh, in 2019, they uh, completed a report on declining productivity. Um, and another report on fertilizer application patterns in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, very recently, they completed a, a project um, looking at stressor interactions, which was mentioned by one of the speakers. And then um, very recently, we uh, completed a, a report on the, uh, on the development of an early warning system framework for um, the Great Lakes, which includes uh, harmful algal blooms. Um, I want to now um, take a minute to uh, remind folks uh, about the sources of phosphorus, uh, which were um, mentioned in the report. And these include atmospheric deposition, uh, potential changes to the redox environment, uh, benthification of phosphorus dynamics and nutrient dynamics um, 
as a result of Dreisenid invasions, um, internal cycling, as well as non-point source delivery from tributaries, including um, runoff from ag fields and, and feed loss. In the eastern part of the basin, um, ag runoff is the largest source of NPS, um, but across the Great Lakes Basin, it's just not at all clear um, what the major drivers are of harmful algal blooms. These are affected by, the, the setup of a bloom is affected by things like um, weather, the seasonal pattern of inputs of nutrients, and in particular, the geographic setting. So what we can predict about harmful algal blooms in the western basin of Lake Erie does not always translate to harmful algal blooms um, in Hamilton Harbor, in Green Bay, and areas um, in uh, Lake Superior, for example. Um, another thing that I think is, uh, has not been mentioned is that um, the pattern for um, nutrient dynamics um, is not the same in the near shore as it is on the offshore. Um, we've seen declining phosphorus concentrations leading to profound food web changes in the offshore of the Great Lakes. And that means that we need to balance the, the um, management um, related to um, tributary inflows relative to um, the cycling offshore. So as many of the speakers have mentioned, um, the move, uh, the, the implementation of regulatory standards and um, a legal framework um, may not be um, the best solution overall for dealing with harmful algal blooms. Um, we may need a, a more localized approach. And in fact, as many of the speakers have mentioned, uh, we probably need to be focused on local solutions that are driven through voluntary programs. I'd like to mention um, one possible uh, approach that the IJC uses for uh, water, reg water level regulation, and that is the Great Lakes St. Louis St. Lawrence River Adaptive Management Committee. Um, this committee focuses on providing monitoring, modeling, and prediction associated with water levels in the Great Lakes. Um, the science that informs this adaptive management approach um, is um, uh, feeds through the Water Quality Board and then um, informs the commissioners who then um, inform the parties. Um, because this is an independent body that provides um, science and monitoring and different um, study approaches, um, this could be a model that could be used um, for providing information about harmful algal blooms um, across the Great Lakes um, in the sense that it could provide the underpinnings of a monitoring, modeling, and prediction system that could be applied um, across the Great Lakes um, using a more localized approach uh, where uh, necessary. Um, as one of our previous speakers said, and I think it was Tricia, um, this is a wicked problem and um, we need some wicked solutions to address um, this um, very, very complex issue overall. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Johnson, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, I believe that at this point, we're, we're pretty much on schedule. So I'm really proud of our panelists for doing a great job. Uh, I was a little, a little worried about how, how we'd be able to do that, but you all did an outstanding job. Um, at 1045, the thought is we're going to start our academic NGO panel, which leaves us um, two minutes and I just I just want to throw out that based on what everybody has said it looks like um, there's a lot of science yet to be done and there's a lot of consideration in terms of um, jurisdictional issues uh, especially especially as uh, Catherine and Irene are emphasizing the need for some type of enforceable enforcement mechanism in addressing 
harmful algal blooms. So I just, does anybody have uh, an additional comment on that from the government regulatory panel? And by the way, um, once we finish the academic NGO panel, we will hear back from Irina and uh, Catherine about their response to what they've heard so far. So anybody, anybody on our regula regulator panel who would like to just look at those overall big issues, science, how do we pin it down? What more do we need to do? And jurisdiction slash enforcement, anything. Anybody? No? Okay. Uh, I know that you all had comments, you all had thoughts. It seems like uh, people want to look at the federal level and keep it involved. And also we need to even go below the state provincial jurisdictions because we need to look at municipalities, counties, et cetera, who also have an issue in terms of runoff, et cetera, that goes into the Great Lakes. Um, well, that being the case, let's then proceed. We're right on time now to the academic NGO panel. We have three panelists today. Uh, we have Todd Brennan, Senior Policy Director, Alliance for the Great Lakes. He's located in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We have Diane DuPont, Scientific Director, Water Economics Policy and Governance Network at Brock University. And we have Howard Lerner, Executive Director of the Environment, Environmental Law and Policy Center. Uh, I've asked of them as well to, uh, to provide their comments within uh, three to five minutes, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers from that panel. Uh, the first presenter is Todd Brennan, Senior Policy Director, Alliance for the Great Lakes. So Todd, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Stephen, and um, it's interesting. I just went to find my screen and it disappeared, but I got these little prompts that I could turn my video on and I can turn my thing. So I can't see myself, but uh, hopefully you all can see me. We can see you, yes. Great, um, well thank you for inviting me to this. And I also just want to say thank you to Kate and I ran out for the very thought provoking approach to this, which I think we all need. So as Stephen said, my name is Todd Brennan and I am from the Alliance for the Great Lakes uh, where I work primarily on nutrient pollution and harmful algal blooms um, and a number of policy issues, but also the Great Lakes quantity and the Great Lakes compact. And I'm usually going from one presentation to another presenting or discussing those topics completely separately. So I give great credit to <laughs> And Kate, I never thought I'd actually see a panel discussion where those two topics came together, conjoined in their paper. So that's kind of an interesting approach for me. But uh, harmful algal blooms and nutrient pollution are preeminent among the issues that the, the Alliance for the Great Lakes deals with. Naturally, as you'd imagine with our name, we are dedicated to ensuring a healthy Great Lakes for future generations of both people and wildlife forever. And given the pervasive uh, nature and growing issue with nutrient pollutions and the resultant harmful algal blooms, it's of great concern to us. It's being dealt with now in every lake, as we've seen from the prior pre presentations, and in lakes like Lake Superior, where historically, up until very recently, that was never uh, an issue. And so this is concerning both because it's growing in its scale and its uh, spatial reach, and also it's unique. It's hitting different parts of the lakes, unlike it has before. Um, and then you can pan to Western Lake Erie, where you have um, nearly 12 million people plagued by their drinking water issues. And none, nothing was more evidence than in the city of Toledo in 2014, when the water was shut off because of uh, uh, cyanotoxins produced by harmful algal blooms for nearly three days. So with that, as a preface, uh, obviously this is a very much important to us and I appreciate the thought exercise and it needs work, right? Because we've, it's been well established even from the prior presentations that this is an issue that's not going away. It's growing in its extent, as I mentioned, uh, and in some cases it's extremity. And we don't seem to be moving the needle necessarily, but worse yet, we don't seem to be knowing where the needle is pointing us. Um, and I think what this paper proposes 
is a mechanism by which we could think about uh, how to sort of gain ground on that part, which is assessment, evaluation, and then funneling that back into actual meaningful policy change that we'll see on the landscape that will ultimately try to ameliorate this problem. Um, at issue for me primarily is uh, accountability and enforcement. It was actually mentioned sixth or last among the critical sub-federal elements that the, the paper proposed. Uh, but I felt like if you put that to number one, it would then be the, um, the lens by which you could look at the other five to assess their effectiveness. Because as we've heard from previous uh, presenters on the, the regulator panel, we do have a lot of these elements. And I think you could, you could argue any one of these things in and of itself uh, but when you take them as a whole, um, does it sort of systemically represent what we need to fix this problem? And I think that's what the paper obviously argues and, and puts good thought into. Um, without an effort towards accountability enforcement, I think any new government's effort would be akin to rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, we know it would be, unfortunately, not intentionally, but it would be a boondoggle. Uh, it probably wouldn't get us where we need to go. So thinking this through is really critical. And I feel like we've heard that we heard that uh, from the previous panelists as well. I think what we see in every jurisdiction is that this accountability and enforcement issue is a tripping block for all jurisdictions. Um, therefore, the premise of having a sort of compact that cuts across all Great Lakes states might have some merit. Um, when we think of it geographically in terms of Green Bay, Western Lake Erie, Hamilton Harbor, it doesn't always make sense to us because we're so used to dealing with those issues specifically in their, their geographic locations. But the idea that we know that this is happening in all great, all states, it's happening in all Great Lakes. And it's also an issue that's happening throughout the state and, and arguably maybe even worse in some inland waterways. Um, I think if you do make comparisons to things like the Great Lakes Basin Resources Compact, it's interesting because you think about when that was implemented, it came with implementing legislation so that laws, policies, and management actually changed to implement that, and it changed across the entire state. There were obviously policies that dealt with the Great Lakes watershed aspects, but largely I, sp I, I spent a lot of time on the Great Lakes Compact. Um, policies changed across the entire state and actually lifted water management and water policy up for the entire state and improved it. Um, so one of the things that it did, that, that the Great Lakes Compact did uh, for us was that. Um, and when it comes to nutrient pollution, everyone also has this in common. Um, so taking the, so there are a little further ahead, thinking, you know, more largely in that way might be more beneficial. Uh, secondly, on that point, the compact changed uh, water management, as I mentioned. Um, so what I would say, it's a, a, it's a mixed review um, on whether it's a doctrine of interstate nuisance, uh, as Kate referenced, um, because I would say it's more driven by what's in it for me principle. It's driven by the fact that if we lose water, that's going to directly impact my state, my people, our jurisdictions. Whereas nutrient pollution uh, deals with the externality of what is largely an economic driven function. And so there's in lies uh, what could be missing from this approach that we need to take into account. And I think was touched on today by some of the different, different folks that are presenting. Um, the compact uh, really lacks a role of the marketplace. Um, it deals primarily with water and water distribution, which you could argue is largely owned by public-based utilities and entities. So it's much easier to hardwire it in that way. Um, what you keep out of it is the fact that there is this um, financial aspect to the, the economic parts that need to be focused on. So I always remind people that in this case with agriculture, farmers or producers are at the short end of a long train where everyone takes their pieces along the way. And so their places are largely fixed and non-negotiable. Therefore, while I'm not letting farmers off the hook by any means, uh, the market and supply, the supply chain, food and energy industries have to help internalize the external costs to this business as well. So they would need to be uh, in, enveloped within to this, this uh, approach um, to a new way of thinking about an interstate compact or agreement um, that takes into account that I think is largely missing somewhere in the nuance between the accountability and enforcement and the marketplace uh, providing force on this. 
I think this could, part, could be part of an implementing policy and funding and could come in the form of the way that states actually internalize this, but being guided by a um, sort of a collective effort around the basin. Now, so all that said, we should try this and it should, uh, it, if we were to try this, it would include, um, it would need to include federal Clean Water Act based tools. So I know it's a sub federal, but obviously a lot of this is predicated upon the interaction, the power, the resources that exist at the federal government. And one of those would be a TMDL. Um, we've seen how this has played out in Western Lake Erie most recently with Ohio um, voluntarily taking on a TMDL based process that's getting underway as we speak. Um, and However, meaning in Western Lake Erie that we need now to link, we have Annex 4, we have the 2015 Collaborative Agreement, and then we have TMDLs at mixed levels throughout the different states that are actually contributing to the problem. So linking this process through the TMDL is pretty critical. And building off of what Ohio has, has done, and, and a, another panelist will probably present on, the Environmental, um, Environmental Law and Policy Center that pushed very hard to get that. Uh, I think would be a pretty key process there. I think at the very least, if you could expand the Western Lake Erie 2015 Collaborative Agreement to include Indiana would be uh, important because it doesn't. And typically with watershed management, you start at the top and you work your way down because any investment done lower than that usually can be impacted or sort of erased by what happens above it. So at the very least, taking that step coming out of this would be very important. Um, lastly, I'll just say I disagree that we just need more money. Um, certainly we do and risks need to be mitigated in very uh, concerted ways, but we also need a better mechanism to actually assess progress and performance for our existing funding and action. Uh, and then we need to communicate that learning. And then next we would need to entrain that learning by improving coordination. And lastly, we need to create those guiding principles that force that learning back into policy change via adaptive management. I feel like sometimes we talk about adaptive management as if it exists in its own vacuum. The reality is that adaptive management has to be telling us to go somewhere, and that needs to actually be put back into action. We can measure progress all we want every year, but if you don't look at the holistic sense of how we're changing over time and how the actions put on the landscape and the money put on the landscape is factored into this, then you won't actually understand what our trend is. But we argue right now that none of us are moving the needle. So we don't need a lot of science to tell us that the, uh, the, that the performance is lacking. And so ultimately, this needs to be linked to, I think, public health and the economy. And those metrics and progress-based metrics need to be brought into that uh, framework so that we can assess our effectiveness and therefore mitigative action. So basically, I'm, I'm in favor of, of thinking about this approach. Uh, and I think that most importantly, we need to consider um, how we do not uh, focus on downstream solutions to upstream problems uh, and to take them into account when we build these sort of infrastructures and agreements and the enforcement accountability that's part of that. And that's all I have to say. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Todd appreciate those comments. And again, I remind everyone that uh, get your questions ready and please put them into the Q&A as opposed to the chat, put them into the Q&A and uh, we'll be ready to go for the question and answer session. Our next presenter on the academic NGO panel is Diane DuPont. Uh, again, Diane is scientific director, Water, Water Economics Policy and Governance Network at Brock University. Diane, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I want to thank uh, you, first of all, Stephen, for the invitation to participate in this workshop. I'd say judging by the breadth and scope of both the panel, uh, both the author and the panel expertise, I'm very hopeful that the issue of mitigating HABs will be greatly moved forward. So I have to uh, first start off by saying, as an economist, I've used a particular framework to think about the question of whether it's time for a binational, binational sub-federal approach. And I would argue that this is a policy assignment question, namely, which set of economic agents, and by that I'm, I broadly define it to include all levels of government with the traditional consumer, supplier, decision-making agents, so which set of economic agents should be responsible for mitigating hazardous algal blooms to achieve the optimal outcome? Now, I'd say there's a related question, which is how should policies 
about around mitigating HABs be decided. And I would argue that's more of a governance issue. And I wanna to speak to both of those, those two things. So let me turn back to the first one, who should be responsible for achieving an optimal outcome. And I'm an economist, so we have to think about the assumptions and that's assuming that the desired outcome is clearly defined and measurable. So I want to discuss four criteria and they are effectiveness, feasibility, efficiency, and evaluation. So when I think about effectiveness, this is really looking at who has the legal authority to undertake actions to achieve the desired goal. While feasibility looks at whether there's a matching of capacity and resources to achieve that goal. And so the question here is, is there sufficient authority already vested in the sub-federal level? Now the paper provides some evidence that this might be the case. But now I want to think about the following, namely, when we've got all of these sub-federal agents involved in this issue, they're gonna need to participate in a type of coalition. And so the question here is, are the enabling conditions for a successful coalition in place? Now, crises often prompt coalition formation. So it appears that the HAB issue may in fact be a window of opportunity. Now, while this might be a necessary condition, it's not sufficient. Individual coalition members are going to need to have capacity, specifically leadership and budgetary resources. But it's also important that the coalition has a common culture that fosters trust and sensitivity to power differentials within the group members. So to the extent that the actors at the sub-federal level have already successfully worked together in the past, I would say that bodes well for future collaborations. But I think it bears repeating that there's need for a common and clear goal to which all members subscribe and I know a number of folks have already spoken about this, as well as the willingness and ability to enforce any commitments by contributing both financial and human resources and undertaking the necessary actions to achieve the goal. Now let me turn to um, efficiency. So efficiency speaks to whether the goal is achieved using the least amount of resources, least cost. And this, gets, this is where it gets tricky because where do the resources come from? They come from essentially tax dollars. So if tax dollars are collected to some extent at the federal level and then transferred to the sub-federal level, we've got costly transactions that are gonna be introduced to the process and these can lead to inefficiencies. And as someone else mentioned, an additional problem lies with the very nature of, of water resources themselves. They're common property with free access. They provide benefits to many uh, it's a type of externality, and we know that the presence of externalities give rise to inefficient outcomes. While there's been quite a bit of success, I would argue, in terms of reducing the point source effluence that may lead to HABs, huge challenges, and a number of people have mentioned this, huge challenges remain when trying to reduce non-point source effluence. And I think there are kind of two key questions that I'd like to see uh, Catherine and Arena address in, in when they're looking at this is, can a sub-federal approach devise methods that are deal more efficiently with these types of non-point source effluents? But then secondly and related, can the sub-federal approach secure the resources that would be necessary to implement monitoring, enforcement, and most importantly, I think, evaluation of progress towards the stated goal? And a bit related to this is whether the sub-federal management can kind of pivot more easily to adapt to changing conditions, as a number of the other panelists have mentioned. Can they adapt more easily and more efficiently than a federal-federal kind of approach? So I want to touch briefly on the second question, which is more the governance one. How should mitigation policies be decided? And I want to highlight two different criteria here. Uh, one is fairness in terms of the public process for choosing the target. And the second is more applicability and sensitivity to local conditions. I would argue that the current efforts of the province of Ontario and the states of Ohio and Michigan to work on the 40% phosphorus runoff reduction target provides an example. Now each 
of those um, agencies has undertaken a collaborative process to develop their own domestic action plans by engaging stakeholders. And I would argue the stated goal is the same. However, we do see differences in the stakeholders who express interest in the process, as well as the nature of conversations and the ultimate plans that emerge from those processes. Um, a fair process needs to ensure that all relevant stakeholders are given an opportunity to provide input. But I think what's really important here is we need to keep in mind that there's a potential inequality of resources and capacity amongst stakeholders. And so this can manifest itself in either a greater or lesser emphasis upon certain um, uh, interests in the conversations and ultimately in the policy documents and the implementation measures that emerge. Obviously this, this can also happen at a federal federal level, but I would argue that disparity of influence and power is more often observed at the lower levels of government. And so I think these differences may tend to have a greater impact upon you know, policy implementation at the sub-federal level as opposed to the goal setting. And I think we need to keep those two apart. There's the goal setting and then there's the implementation. So I would argue that any kind of mechanism that will involve the sub-federal level, and there's some examples out there, should also be dealing with mechanisms to mitigate any policy, uh, any kind of power differentials that uh, exist, and it needs to be part of the uh, policy implementation discussions at the outset. I, I just conclude by saying I think the authors have put forward a very thought-provoking and worthwhile challenge. I think actually reframing the HABs problem at the sub-federal level, whether or not it, it formally becomes that, is a step closer to the kind of framework that economists espouse for efficient decision-making, namely a more direct link between who is making the decisions and paying the costs for the decisions and then who will ultimately benefit from those decisions. And uh, I look forward to further discussion with everyone on the panel and the authors. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Diane, for that outstanding presentation. Our next and final panelist is Howard Lerner, Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Howard. Thank you, Steve, for convening this and for inviting me to join the panel. And one of the nice things is when you follow people like Todd and Diane, you can sort of refer to and what they said. <laughs> Todd's good point on the importance, and I would double down on that with regard, Catherine and Irena, to your paper to move up the accountability and enforcement point to a principal position at the top. And Diana's point about economics Right now, what we are seeing is CAFO owners who are producing tremendous amounts of manure that go into Western Lake Erie, causing toxic algae blooms, not uh, internalizing the cost, but rather externalizing the cost onto the public. So thank you, Stephen, for pulling this together. Uh, thank you to the Institute and to my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the public interest attorney who serves as the executive director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center which is the Midwest leading environmental legal advocacy and eco-business innovation organization. I'm also a adjunct professor at the University of Michigan Law School and Northwestern University Law School, teaching advanced seminars on energy law, environment and climate change policy. I'm the lead attorney for the plaintiffs environmental law and policy center and advocates for Clean Lake Erie in our joint lawsuit with Lucas County, Ohio, against the US EPA to clean up Western Lake Erie from the recurring toxic algae outbreaks that impair safe clean water, harm fisheries in the Northern Ohio economy, and deter enjoyable outdoor recreation for so many people. Uh, US District Court Judge James Carr has twice ruled in the plaintiff's favor, concluding that the US EPA violated the Clean Water Act and the TMDLs are legally required remedies to reduce the pollution causing the recurrent toxic algae outbreaks. And to differ just slightly with Todd, who referred to the Ohio EPA moving forward with voluntary TMDLs, um, the, the on the ground reality here is they weren't doing TMDLs. Ohio EPA refused to do them until Judge Carr ordered that as a remedy. Um, I'm glad to see they're moving forward with TMDLs right now, but it, it was as a result of enforcement, key point that Todd made earlier, uh, and 
the agency than following what the court said. Um, as Tricia Mitchell pointed out, in Western Lake Erie, there is an existing binational, sub-regional, binational, sub-national, regional framework, and that's the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, Annex 4. So we ought to sort of look at how that's working or not working. Uh, hopefully, Catherine and Irina, in terms of providing some guidance for your paper, because what you're suggesting in terms of a framework is actually in place when it comes to Western Lake Erie. Uh, in the litigation, plaintiffs have asked the court to enter a remedial order that would require the state of Ohio and the US EPA to adopt enforceable regulatory standards. Uh, point that was made earlier by Todd, it's not just money. Enforceable regulatory standards sufficient to achieve a reduction of phosphorus in Western Lake Erie of 40% by 2025. To be clear, that's not just a number and a deadline that we pulled out of a hat. That is exactly what's provided by the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Annex 4, which the US EPA and the state of Ohio committed to do in signing, and have since recommitted to do. In short, the federal and state agencies would take the actions that they've committed to do to achieve what they committed to do in signing Annex 4 and have since committed and recommitted to do. Uh, it's been established that voluntary actions are not enough. Uh, both panelists have made that point. Uh, and that payments to agricultural operators that they will only reduce if they're paid is not consistent with the structure of at least American environmental law. Think about it in the following analogy. Um, a large industrial facility is emitting um, hazardous and toxic chemicals into Lake Erie, causing public health and environmental harms. That industrial polluter says, but aha, we're not gonna comply with the Clean Water Act and reduce our chemical emissions that are leading to those sorts of problems unless we are paid to not do so. That of course isn't correct when it comes to the Clean Water Act and industrial facilities. And with regard to toxic algae outbreaks in Western Lake Erie, uh, we'll get into the data in a minute. Uh, it's principally a problem, 90% according to the Ohio EPA, coming from agricultural runoff. Um, the paper here offers uh, an elegant solution that's complicated and across the region will take many years to accomplish, uh, while if effect the lakes are burning or more accurately are poisoned and contaminated. Um, we appreciate Catherine and Arena, you've included accountability and enforcement in your solutions metrics. Um, as Todd suggested, it needs to go up in terms of priority. The lack of enforcement and accountability or here a failure of political accountability and responsibility is what's being shown in the place where we do have a binational subnational framework operating, namely Annex 4, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The direct, not simple, but the direct solution is for the political leadership of Ohio and the other states in Ontario to belly up to the bar, uh, have a stiff drink, and do what they've signed up and committed to do, namely take the necessary actions as determined and validated by sound science to reduce phosphorus pollution into Western Lake Erie by 40% by 2025. That's what the commitment has been. In short, we're facing a problem of political will under the existing Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and a new elegant governance framework won't fix that problem. Courts acting to require enforcement help fix the problem because quite frankly, they give the governors sometimes cover to do politically what they otherwise don't want to do on their own. The science here is largely known and largely agreed upon. And I'll turn here to the state of Ohio's own nutrient mass balance study with a comprehensive piece of science and its 2020 integrated report. Uh, Jeff Reuter, a uh, prominent scientist who led the science team working with policymakers on Annex 4 
and subscribed a suite of actions that Ohio can take to achieve its commitment to pollution reductions. Um, let me, if you will, sound a little bit here like marketplace on NPR and do it by the numbers. I'm going to pull up one slide. Um, let's see, hopefully if this comes up, it's pretty easy to follow. Can somebody just tell me, yep, the slide is up. Thank you, Todd. So here are the numbers, folks, at least 60%, 90%, 54% more, and 40% at least 60% of the phosphorus pollution in Western Lake Erie comes from Ohio. That's been pretty firmly established. Some say 70%. 90% of the phosphorus pollution entering Western Lake Erie from Ohio comes from agricultural runoff pollution. That's the Ohio EPA's numbers, uh, fertilizers from corn and soy fields and manure from CAFOs, the fastest growing part of this is CAFOs and manure, right? If CAFOs and the manure runoff continues to go up, then in effect, we're chasing our tails. One of the solutions in that is to begin to regulate CAFOs much more intensively than they are now. Right now, a CAFO with less than 2,500 animals doesn't even have to get a permit. So not surprisingly, there are a lot of CAFOs operating with 2,400 animals uh, below the 2,500 limit. If you do the math, 60% times 40, 90% means that 54% or more, 54 to 60% of the phosphorus pollution entering Western Lake Erie comes from Ohio agricultural runoff. Okay. Um, some of you may know the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton. Uh, as a public interest attorney, I followed the Willie Sutton rule. Willie Sutton was asked, why did he rob banks? He famously responded, because that's where the money is. The answer here is, where's the pollution? More than 54% of the pollution that's leading to Western Lake Erie's recurring toxic algae outbreaks problems is coming from Ohio's agricultural runoff, and that is coming indeed uh, from CAFOs and manure and from fertilizers. So you simply can't, as a matter of math, reduce phosphorus pollution by 40% by 2025 unless you reduce the amount that's coming in from the agricultural sector in Western Lake Erie in, from Ohio. That's where the pollution is. That's simply math. It's not all that complicated. We don't need to desperately seek data. That's where the pollution is. What's required to reduce it, accountability and enforcement, is the political will to do so. With 2025 coming up, Ohio's political leaders can no longer kick the can down the road if the state of Ohio and the US EPA want to live up to their pollution reduction commitments under Annex 4, the challenge is legal, the willingness of the federal courts to enforce compliance. The challenge is political, the willingness of Governor DeWine, Ohio EPA, to live up to their commitments as the deadlines close in, and action is required and can no longer be deferred. This is a long-standing political science problem and issue. When you have a binational sub-federal framework in place, where the commitments to reduce pollution are down the road, it is relatively easy for a governor in 2016 to commit to do something that won't have to really be done until 2025 and avoid making tough decisions, kick the can. So what's the state of Ohio doing right now? With 2025 coming around, the state of Ohio is saying, give us another two, three years to try to figure out the TMDLs which in effect then kicks the can to the next governor. So the answers now are do your job now. That's the accountability and enforcement piece. The governors need to step up and live up to their promises and commitments. The costs of inaction are literally billions of dollars to the Northern Ohio economy, public health threats, ecological harms, loss of enjoyable fishing, canoeing, kayaking, boating, and swimming, and nice species for millions of people. Lake Erie should be fishable and swimmable as the Clean Water Act requires. Uh, my suggestions then to Catherine and Irena on your paper are 
bump up the accountability and enforcement piece of what you're looking at and at least take a look at the one place where there is a binational uh, subnational framework and figure out how to help us solve that accountability and enforcement uh, challenge, which is both political with the governors and involves the court stepping up as well to act where the political figures have not. Um, thank you for your time, and I'd be glad to join Todd and Diane uh, in addressing questions and suggestions. Okay. Thank you very much, Howard, for that uh, provocative review. Much appreciated. Um, well, now it is uh, time for the question and answer portion of our program. We're going to go with that until approximately 15 minutes before noon, at which time we're going to invite Catherine and Irina to respond to everything that they've heard. Uh, we do have some questions uh, that, that, uh, that have been provided to us from our attendees, as well as um, others that we think are important. And I, I want to start off. We've... Um, We've identified before, you know, in the 60s and 70s that point sources like wastewater treatment plants were a big problem and there were successful solutions apparently for those. I'd like to ask uh, Lucinda Johnson a question and that is, given the diverse drivers and sources of nutrients driving harmful algal blooms, is there a sufficient understanding of the relative influence of each of the sources to determine whether a 40% reduction in spring loads would actually lead to fewer harmful algal blooms? I mean, we've, we've talked now about non-point source, in particular agriculture. Howard's been very direct on that as to what's happening in Western Basin of Lake Erie. Um, Lucinda, can you respond? Um, thanks for that question, Stephen. Um, the answer is that we are pretty confident about some aspects of that equation um, for certain geographies of the Great Lakes, the western arm of Lake of um, um, western basin of Lake Erie um, being one. I would say that uh, the there is less certainty with respect to um, other parts of Lake Erie and certainly across other parts of the Great Lakes. Uh, so the, uh, as, as Howard has mentioned, um, the, the numbers uh, with respect to loadings into the, the Western Arm are, are fairly well established and, and uh, I suspect that the uh, forty percent reduction is a a valid number, uh, but that that is not um, I, not well established for other parts of the Great Lakes. Okay, uh, would would our, is it, would anybody else like to respond? Tricia, yes, and you're on mute. So I sorry. Okay, um, I guess what I would just like to clarify is. So the 40% reduction targets really only, I know people have talked about them in terms of applying to the Great Lakes, but they really only were set for Lake Erie and actually for specific parts of Lake Erie. And in that case, um, we have coordinated science between Canada and the US, our state and, and provincial agencies. We've developed dose response curves. And one of the things I wanted to mention was a lot of the items that actually, I think almost all of the items that are presented in the paper as unknowns, like atmospheric deposition, dry scented mussels, all of those are incorporated in our models in Lake Erie. And the science is continuously being updated. So the models are being updated based on the new science. So we are, I mean, based on the best available science, we can say that if we achieve those targets, we will have a bloom similar to the 2012, which was a modest bloom, nine out of 10 years. And we have an adaptive framework, adaptive management framework in place that says, as we get new science that tells us something different, we're gonna, update and change our management accordingly. So um, yeah, I just, I guess I wanted to point that out. And then um, as Lucinda said, the other um, basins that are experiencing harmful algal 
plumes around the Great Lakes. It's, I guess, a little bit of a different situation for each one. So again, in Hamilton Harbor on the Canadian side under the AOC program, we've said, what do we think? We've done a ton of science to say, what do we need to do to get to those blooms? And then we have uh, remedial action plans and, and a process in place to, to get to the objective. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, would, any, would any of the other panelists like to respond to that question? Okay, let me see. Can you repeat the question, sorry again. Yes, the, the question was, um, and I'm gonna go back so I get it correct, correctly. Given the, the diverse drivers and sources of nutrients driving harmful algal blooms, is there a sufficient understanding of the relative influence of each of the sources to determine whether a 40% reduction in spring lows would actually lead to fewer harmful algal blooms? Todd, do you wanna, do you have anything to say on that? I, I think Trisha handled it, handled it well. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, depends on the geography. 40% uh, was obviously defined for Western Lake Erie, however, across the Great Lakes Basin. If, and that's one area I would love to hear more from Irena and um, Catherine about whether they were thinking of just applying that across the Great Lakes Basin as a blanket reduction target just for everybody to have a, a spree to core, you know, uh, goal to shoot for, or they would be relevant because there's certain areas where you do have geographically uh, devised goals. So uh, Green Bay is another one, another EPA designated algae outbreak hotspot. Our goal is actually a 60% reduction. So it's uh, more than Western Lake Erie in terms of proportion, less in overall actual load. But uh, a 40%, regardless, I'll take 40%, 60%. I'll take anything at this point because it's a flat line. If nothing, it's actually going downward. Very good. Uh, Jim Blanchard, do you have a question? Governor Blanchard, I, I saw your hand, so. Uh, first of all, I've really enjoyed all of this and I liked Howard Lerner getting right to the point. So it sounds like a very brilliant University of Michigan professor. Anyway, uh, my question really was at the outset. Oh, boy. Was, yes, at the outset, there was a map uh, that I think I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was probably Catherine's map of the Great Lakes region, and you had yellow dots and green dots. You didn't really say what those were. I was curious. I'm I'm obviously aware of the Western Lake Erie issue. It and by the way, locally it gets a lot of attention. So I think there's a way to stimulate political will. This is something of great concern for at least people in Ohio along the shoreline, and certainly Michigan, and probably I'm sure Ontario. But go back to that map for everybody. You didn't identify what those dots meant. I'm, I assume they're degrees of concentration of, of the problem. But that first map, that's all my question is. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, a map that um, Irina and Catherine uh, had in your presentation. Catherine, can you? Yep, I'm me? trying to bring it up. Hang on one second. One I, can, I can speak to that. Uh, the, the dots were yellow and green. The yellow were occurrence of algal blooms and the green were occurrence of recorded toxin producing algal blooms. And the comment was, whereas a lot of focus has been on Western uh, Basin of Lake Erie, uh, we're finding through newspaper reports and anecdotal evidence that this is spreading throughout the Great Lakes. Can you? Pull that up. All right, here we are. All right, so repeat exactly what you said. You remember, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yellow dots are the locations where algal blooms have been reported. The green dots are where algal blooms that are toxic, so they contain toxins like microcystin have been reported. The interesting thing in generating this map was I was, un, I was able to go to the scientific literature to get occurrences of some of these for outside of Lake Erie, in particular Lake Superior um, and Lake Huron. But there is a lack of a coordinated method between the two countries to actually monitor um, these algal blooms. And as a result, I think it's a challenge to manage them. That was the comment I wanted to make about this map. 
All right, and I realize now at the top you did identify that, so you'll have to forgive me for asking such a basic question, but thank no, you. No need to apologize. Yeah, there's, that's a good question, and uh, thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, we have another question that come in from uh, Jennifer English, uh, the city of Defiance, Ohio, and she she comments that the city of Defiance is currently working with Ohio EPA and that they are moving on a CSO strategy to, water, uh, to watershed approach. She asked the question, how can the city of Defiance have the most impact with that program? Anybody, anybody want to comment on that? Uh, Stephen, I'll say um, in uh, Jennifer, one place to look is Wisconsin, where we have uh, a phosphorus rule. It was called. It was passed back in 2012. So it sets a statewide standard for phosphorus um, in all water bodies, and then geographically specific ones where that's um, present, such as a TMDL, would actually provide you even a more accurate picture. And what it also does is it provides alternative compliance mechanisms for point sources. So what that means is I think what you're getting at, which is a, a um, water treatment plant or even an industry that finds itself usually at the bottom of a watershed is dealing not only with its pollution, but everything that's coming above it. And the premise is kind of simple. You can do this in different ways. There's trading mechanisms. They usually haven't been proven to work. Uh, or in Wisconsin, which is very unique, it's called the adaptive management option. It's actually just a watershed-based approach. And what it says is, hey, if you're a big guy with a big load, it's going to cost you a lot of money in today's dollars to try to bring down your pollution level when the reality is that's still just a small percentage of what's flowing past your pipe from up above the watershed. I give you an example. Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District has forecasted this may cost them $200 million. They also forecasted if they just worked with farmers upstream, they could probably get at that for around $100 million. Still big money, right? But they just caught themselves a 50% discount by working with those upstream. And the idea is if they do enough of that work upstream, what flows past their pipe eventually um, can get up to water quality standards provided they're given enough time. Uh, but they're very tightly, it's all very tightly controlled by the regulatory agency, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Uh, that they can get to that water quality and actually take time to reduce their reduction. But if everybody does their part, they get the water quality to a point where it actually saves them all money um, and deals with the source at its source upstream. So I, I would just say there's been a ton of work that's been done on this in Wisconsin and different approaches. So I, I would point you towards that. Great, great. Thank you very much. Would anyone and another place, another place you might look at would be Des Moines, Iowa, where the wastewater treatment system there has been under considerable pressure from uh, upstream ag runoff that's required, nutrient runoff that's required uh, considerable expenditure to up, update and Im improve the uh, Des Moines waterworks. It's a similar situation to Defiance, where you are both downstream from ag runoff coming in from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and upstream of on the Maumee for what goes into Toledo. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any, anybody? Uh, Chitra, did you want to comment? Sure, Steve. Thank you. So just a couple of approaches here in Ontario. First of all, we have a regulatory approach to the Nutrient Management Act. Uh, it is quite a strong piece of legislation that uh, looks at farming operations of a certain size and so on. And I'm sure there's an equivalent across the border as well. Um, and so within that, you need to set up nutrient management plans to address the application of manure and so on, biosolids, and nutrient management strategies, uh, which, which uh, help look at the other activities, including the storage of manure and so on on farms. Um, it is uh, limited to a certain size of farm, although um, other types of farming activities and smaller operations uh, may, uh, may be phased in. Uh, in the future. And then in the non-regulatory approach is, is where an organization like mine comes into play, which is a watershed-based approach. It is uh, based on incentive programs. Many of our stewardship programs are funded by municipalities. And that's where we talk cover crops and, and so on, and all of the agricultural best practices and urban best practices, lots of messaging to the urban uh, residents as well, even though the, uh, 
the quantities might be uh, much lower from, from an urban setting. Um, and so there's different packages, different you know, messaging and different programs, uh, working very closely with the agriculture uh, community. But uh, I think our challenge now is keeping up with the science. So it is concerning when you see something like um, agricultural best practices, uh, such as making sure we're using fertilizers uh, with dissolved phosphorus or actually increasing the plant available phosphorus in the Great Lakes. And so keeping up with the science will be a challenge uh, for us when it comes to watershed management. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jitra. Any, and would anybody else like to comment on that question? We do have some other questions coming in. Uh, one goes back to the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Uh, the question is from Shirley Tomasello, and she asks, could you explain more about how uh, total maximum daily loads or limits in Western Lake Erie works to reduce harmful algal blooms? I think this is a technical question. Would anybody like to answer that one? I think we need one of our, some of our scientists on our panel to talk, you know. Uh, Madeline, how about you? Can you weigh in on this? Um, I can't weigh in on the TMDL in Lake Erie since I'm in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so hopefully someone else can. I'm sorry. Also, it's it's a it's a U.S. instrument, so we can't weigh in from the Canadian. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> All right. This uh, is Karen. I can't weigh in on the Lake Erie TMDL because I. I don't, I don't actually, I'm not, I don't think New York is part of that, but Don's Lansley could certainly correct me on it. Um, but I could at least say what a TMDL is because um, it is a, it is a U.S. implement <laughs> uh, regulatory program um, that is, it, the TMDL stands for total maximum daily load. And what it is, is, a, is an equation that basically looks at all the pollutant sources um, that are it, uh, potentially impacting a water body and identifies what those sources are and identifies what the um, acceptable amount would be able to continue to go to that water body while still achieving water quality standards. And so it's kind of like a pollution diet, so to speak. So we identify what all the inputs in and then we say, okay, well, in order to achieve water quality standards, we need to reach this new level. And then we work towards reaching that new level. So a TMDL is really an equation, but uh, what is really key and important within a TMDL is the implementation plan of the section, which says how are we gonna actually get to what that uh, you know, reduction would really be. And that's gets into understanding what all those sources are and then identifying practices and actions that would then lead those sources um, to reduce the amount that they are, you know, um, contributing to that water body. Okay, thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on this? Uh, Steve, if you want to, if you'd like me to take a very quick crack at it, I can sure. do that. Sure. Um, but without teaching a whole class here on the Clean Water Act, trying to follow up nicely on the previous comment, when you have an area like Western Lake Erie, the target is to avoid the impairment of waters. There's been a finding under the Clean Water Act that the waters of Western Lake Erie are impaired by pollution. So the pollution diet that was just referred to is TMDL's total maximum daily load means taking the steps that are necessary to reduce the amount of inflow of phosphorus pollution so that the waters no longer become impaired. The science right now is that you need to reduce phosphorus pollution by 40%. So what the TMDLs would be designed to do is reduce in the waterways that go into Western Lake Erie, the amount of phosphorus, the total maximum daily load down to a level so that the waters no longer would be impaired. Okay. Hopefully Thank that's you. helpful. Thank you. Howard. That's very helpful. And uh, this is um, Yes. Can I add just a little bit on that? Sure, Mike, go ahead. Sure. I, I want to point out too that um, the TMDL doesn't offer any more regulatory control than are currently in place. There is an option under the integrated report and listing methodologies or listing water bodies 
is not supporting is a, what's referred to as a five alternative, which is a mechanism with which you don't necessarily have to develop a total maximum daily load to reach the goal of, of uh, support, meeting a, or supporting the designated use that's listed. Michigan's listed our waters is not supporting for other indigenous aquatic life. And we feel like we're, and we've also listed for drinking water at the near shore areas, but we feel like um, for our next listing, our, we're gonna probably change our listing from not supporting to five, that five alternative because we, um, again, with the toolbox that we have in place right now, the tools that we have, the five alternative and using the Annex 4 and the domestic action plan is the method that we'll use to reach the goals of meeting those designated uses. Um, so again, the, the Tyndall, everyone, uh, Howard was exactly right. It's a diet. Everyone is, uh, Karen was exactly right as the, the principal of the TMDL. We're doing watershed planning to identify the diet for Western Lake Erie for our non-point sources. We've identified, you know, that portion for our point source contributions and they have already pretty much met those goals. The non-point source is the difficulty. The TMDL doesn't give us any more regulatory authority. We're still working on planning, the, the planning process, which ident identifies it um, at a very small scale, at the HUC-12 scale, what loadings can be and should be reduced from the non-point source contributions. And so that's how we're moving forward and, and why Michigan at this point is not developing a TMDL for Western Lake Erie, our portion of Western Lake Erie. Okay, this, by the way, leads to another question that um, has been a theme throughout, and uh, I think a lot of the dialogue has, has talked about the fact that um, harmful algal brooms and phosphorus and nitrogen, it's, it's complex, it's complex, and we're focusing a lot on phosphorus, and, and now that point sources seem to be under control, we're we're looking at agriculture and wondering, you know, why don't the farmers do something and stop putting so much phosphorus fertilizer on their ground and draining it into Lake Erie or wherever. And the question I have for you, uh, we've had two anonymous attendees ask a question about this particular issue. Uh, you know, wetlands were filled in with government assistance. Um, they now fertilize that property. It's got uh, drainage going into the Lake Great Lakes. Uh, what do you think about incentives on agriculture to attack that issue? And uh, what do you think about uh, the requirements and abilities for states to meet their reductions on phosphorus <laughs> given this type of issue with, with agriculture? Who'd like to tackle Steven? that? Yes. Stephen, this is Katrina, and I'll just say that um, this is a, a problem and a challenge that we live and breathe every day in Minnesota. Um, we are, as noted, uh, under our nutrient reduction plan, required to reduce water going north, going east, and going south. And our nutrient reduction strategy super specifically says these are the ways we can get to our 45% reduction in phosphorus and in, in nitrogen. And we're, it's just not happening. And I think that at the core, we're never going to buy our way out of this. So incentives will only work, I would say, maybe if you can maximize incentives, if you could get more federal dollars, more state dollars, maybe you'll get 10% adoption. And it really is getting grassroots support and buy-in for ownership of this. And I think part of it is if we want to continue to be the breadbasket for the world and for the nation, we need to be honest about what it costs to grow food and to have that be a successful part of our economy and factor that into the cost of things. And uh, the Des Moines case is one that, that keeps c coming up. If, if we are polluting drinking water downstream, who bears that economic burden to remove those pollutants. If we are polluting drinking water downstream in Toledo, whose responsibility is that as society as a whole? I don't think government programs alone are going to solve this problem. And so I think you need to look at the public-private nexus and figure out, is this a public good that we all really need to be invested in? And then what is the private component of it? Because at least in Minnesota, our, our planning and the best of our efforts 
to incentivize is, is showing that we're not on track to get to where we need to be. Thank, thank hey, you. Everybody let's, get Howard. Let, you. Let's take it this way. First, nobody wants to be against incentives, okay? In, in, incentives are a good thing. But the fact of the matter is, as previous commenters have said, Money alone is not going to solve this problem. There isn't going to be enough money to do it. And from a both a moral as well as a practical and legal standpoint, if you live in Toledo, Ohio, or in Lucas County, and Lucas County is a co-plaintiff in the case before the courts, right? So the county that surrounds and the city of Toledo has filed amicus briefs. The question is whether someone upstream of where you are can knowingly put a chemical into your water that causes toxic algae blooms and poisons the water supply. To use the legal example I mentioned before, if there were a factory that were upstream that were putting toxic chemicals into the water, that was going down to your home, Steve, or into Lake Erie, you would say, they can't do that. They should not be allowed under the Clean Water Act to do that. Nobody has a right upstream to contaminate your water downstream, at least to the degree that it becomes toxic and led to half a million people in, Western, in Toledo being without safe drinking water supply for 72 hours. So the fact of the matter is if 90% of the phosphorus coming into Western Lake Erie is from agriculture, agriculture is going to need to be regulated in the same way that point sources are regulated. And a large CAFO with 10,000 hogs or pigs or cows that is sluicing manure into the water conceptually is not all that different than a large factory that's doing the same. It's a factory farm, some people call it. This is not uh, Grant Wood of mom and pop on their 30 acres who are engaged in uh, the bucolic farming that we've discussed for years and looked at as part of America. This is large factories with tens and thousands of animals with manure that's poisoning the water supply of a million people just on the Ohio side in Western Lake Erie. So regulatory standards that are enforceable are a necessary part of any solution. And to say that we're somehow going to do this with federal money or state money or taxing the public and that alone through incentives is gonna solve the problem uh, is not dealing at least in this particular area, Western Lake Erie, may be different in Hamilton Bay, may be different on Lake Superior. But in this particular area, it's going to require enforceable regulatory standards to reduce uh, manure that is growing enormously and poisoning the water supply in Western Lake Erie. That's the reality of it. And we will see what the U.S. District Court does in its next couple of decisions, because that issue in many ways is really in front of the courts and it goes to what's required under the Clean Water Act. And for the questions about what happens in Wisconsin or Minnesota and so forth, let, in candor, keep an eye on what the U.S. District Court does in the Northern District of Ohio, uh, all of which those states are in U.S. EPA Region 5. Certainly, Wisconsin or Minnesota are not bound by what happens from a federal district court judge in the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, but it certainly will become persuasive authority and perhaps precedent for a number of the other states. With regard to uh, Ontario, um, I don't obviously the U U.S. court decisions are not controlling, but I expect that if the U.S. District Court rules that actions are required, um, creative people in Ontario are going to find ways to, by analogy, uh, see if they might use some of that. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very much, Howard. Well, we're now at that point. I think we've managed to cover the questions from our attendees, at least the subject matters of those questions and the categories. And it's now time to turn this discussion back to the two people who brought us here with their subfederal binational approach to harmful algal blooms. 
and to get their responses, at least preliminarily, uh, to the dialogue that we've had today. So I'm going to turn it back to Irina and Catherine. Thanks, Stephen, very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So um, I'm going first because I wanted to basically provide the highlights of what I heard and how I think it might influence our proposal for a subnational agreement. I have four slides to share um, and I'll start immediately and then Kate will come through with an overall summary. What we heard today was uh, there is uh, basically an expression of the Great Lakes community needs. Uh, we need to share data and predictive tools to get ahead of the curve and we need a hammer to ensure that data gathering and sharing is done. We also need to share regulatory approaches and this is at the local to uh, regional levels. How do jurisdictions reduce uh, non-point sources and have hotspots? And we also need monitoring, modeling, and prediction approaches across the entire Great Lakes, but also a localized strategy to deal with the diversity of causal pathways that create some of these harmful algal blooms. In terms of the science needs, um, what I heard was that we need to consider uh, climate change and invasive species in a bigger way. Land to water pathways under a changing climate are increasing the risk of these algal blooms. But we also need to know that the Great Lakes is a very heterogeneous entity. And we need to recognize that the Great Lakes may suffer from too little phosphorus, for example, in the open waters, but too much phosphorus in the near shore areas. We also heard the need to integrate diverse knowledges and in particular indigenous and non-indigenous knowledges into any framework, whether it's a binational, subnational, or local. We need convergent approaches. And, and I'm thinking of convergence here in the, in the spirit of the National Science Foundation in the United States, one of their 10 brilliant ideas uh, report, which is a bringing together of all different disciplines to create new approaches and new ways of addressing problems. So I say that we need convergent approaches to understand the causal pathways, integrating evolving and emerging data science and models into any proposed framework. What was uh, very interesting in particular to me was the need for place-based strategies. A one-size-fits-all approach clearly will not work because the causal pathways are complex. And given this, uh, and they differ in different areas of a given lake as well as among lakes, we need to uh, think you know, about frameworks for developing these or criteria for developing these types of place-based strategies. And how would we then in turn include them into a, a framework? And finally, the, the idea that we all have limited resources, particularly given what the day that we're living in with the pandemic and climate change and all those other demands, can we identify hot spots or have priority areas of concern so that we can focus on controlling point and non-point sources to these areas of concern? In terms of the policy needs, what I heard, heard repeatedly was that there are many regulatory instruments and some may argue that some are stronger where others feel that they could be improved. But I still maintain that we need to harmonize the regulatory instruments at different jurisdictional uh, levels. Next, we need to innovate and ad, have innovative and agile policies to reflect advancing science and here lies the question of what kind of framework lends itself most to being able to be nimble and responsive to these advancing science developments. And then finally, we need uh, incentive programs. You know, one of the, it, someone once told me that um, in any given problem, 10% of the solution is provided by science and 90% is about human behavior and how you affect that change on the ground. And so people talked about the need of how you change behavior in managing this harmful algal bloom wicked problem. So I think we need to consider more robustly the incentive programs to support evidence-based policies uh, for strong on the ground actions. In my final slide, I wanna just kind of revisit the, the question that we started with. Do we need a new subnational agreement perhaps? I heard arguments that the binational agreements are important, and by this I mean the, uh, at the federal level, because it allows us to focus on shared objectives that bring stability and resilience to the two countries working together. 
And I fully agree with that. I also heard that Annex 4 is a subnational agreement for Western Lake Erie. And the question would be, is it more agile than a federal federal approach? And I think everybody would agree that it is. But then I think the question then becomes, can the subnational agreement devise methods that are more effective in dealing with HABs? How do we get resources for science, monitoring, implementation, and both the effectiveness and efficiency of compliance monitoring to achieve the goals? How do we deal with power differentials? And how can we incorporate basically getting down there to Willie Sutton and going to where the money is? How can we incorporate the economics into that compliance? So the idea is that, and, and just throughout all of this, we always need to consider both the upstream and downstream factors for what contributes to harmful algal blooms. Next, I want, you know, speaking when Diane was speaking about the enabling conditions for either an improved or expanded subnational agreement, are these in place? So she referred to it as a coalition. A, a coalition needs a common culture. A coalition needs shared goals. And a coalition needs members with leadership and uh, budgetor, budgetary resources to help them get the job done. And then finally, I, I, a recurring theme that I think to me is perhaps the most interesting takeaway that I got today goes back to Willie Sutton. You go to where the fertilizer is, you go to where the power is. And where the power is in this case is largely in agriculture. Uh, farmers are the ones who have to deal with the end of pipe consequences, but there are much larger sectors with the food and energy sectors that play a role. And uh, Todd spoke about that. So while many regulatory elements already exist, they're not working optimally to reduce the risk of uh, the wicked problem of HABs. And I still wonder and would like to hear Kate's comments if a modified or expanded subnational agreement may help reduce the risk of HABs, in part because it may bring the marketplace in terms of the food and energy sectors uh, to the table, and they absolutely need to be part of the solution. Kate, I turn it over to your thoughts now. Thank you. Uh, I am um, neither as organized nor as brilliant as Irina. I have no slides to provide. I, I wrote my comments down on, on uh, plain old yellow legal pads. Um, very, very briefly, <clears throat> I, I can't thank you all enough. I am in awe of your expertise and your comments and your insights, all of which um, both of us obviously have taken dutiful notes on and will incorporate to the extent possible and practical into our paper. Um, so one of the really key points that I heard is, you know, a, a subfederal agreement would have to be a real value add. Tracking the Great Lakes Water, Water Quality Agreement is, is not going, you know, really to add anything. So the collective, you know, aspirational 40% I haven't talked to Irina about this, but in my view is out. Um, <laughs> I, um, that being said, with regard to the comments about really focusing on enforcement and accountability, on the one hand, while I, apps, I, I get that and in the paper, we will elevate that to um, a different place. You know, um, Howard, to your point about it really being a political problem leaves me a little depressed. <laughs> Right. I, I don't know, even if, you know, even if there were that value add and, you know, we, you know, this magically came together, um, if there's no political will for to to implement, that's a real problem. So um, I have to I have to really sort of um, process that. Um, and, and really, a, uh, several folks commented on this, and it's sort of that tension, and you know, something that Irina and I have grappled with, that tension between the solutions being very much place-based, right? Like, very much place-based, and we get that. Um, but wondering if there is a, you know, a role, right? So I heard, and Irina um, provided some of this feedback, I heard, you know, information sharing. I heard maybe, you know, science. I heard um, um, best practice, right? I, I'm, I'm not aware that, 
you all get together on you know an ongoing basis and share that way i don't know i mean obviously there are professional conferences and things like that but i just wonder if that might be a role and again clearly we wouldn't have a compact for something like that um but 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 maybe there's something there so irena and i will process all of your thoughtful feedback and comments and insights. And um, I just really want to thank you all uh, for your participation. It's been terrific. Thank you, uh, Catherine, and thank you, Irina. I would like to say that uh, we're right on schedule. I have one minute to wrap up. But um, I think it's true. If you put a lot of good people into a room, even if it's virtual, um, and you focus them on a problem, hopefully solutions will arise. And I think that's what's happened today. You know, this is a big issue. There are a lot of complicating factors to it. It's different across the Great Lakes. It's a huge area. It's 22% of the world's surface fresh water. And it's probably not one size fits all. But we had a lot of brain power today looking at the issue. And for that, uh, the Canada-U.S. Law Institute is very grateful. I'd like to say on behalf of our co-chairs, Jim Blanchard and Jim Peterson, Jim Peterson, former Minister of International Trade for, for Canada, as well as myself as the U.S. National Director and my counterpart, Kai Carmody, the Canadian National Director, and all the support staff here, Eric Seiler, Mark, as well as Claire for all their help in doing this. Uh, thank you very much to all our panelists. We had a fabulous group of panelists. Uh, you all did a good job. Thanks for your hard work in reading the report, commenting on it, and giving some direction to our two authors. We hope that this is the beginning of a solution, uh, that things are going to get better, that harmful algal blooms will be solved. And with that, uh, at this time, I'd like to adjourn this symposium and hope that uh, we're going to have some healthy waters in the Great Lakes in the years to come. Thank you again, everyone.